Um, so that's, that's why it's mandated. So they see a need for power, and we need to, being the utility in the area, we need to provide it. Is that data available for folks to see, oh, the, those studies about what capacity sure. is, when it's going to come online, and sure, and yeah, yeah. I don't, I, I don't have the exact man, the, the date that they gave us off the, uh, in my notes here, but it's online, and I'm happy to provide it as well. <clears throat> you Thank guys you. Uh, aren't the source of power anymore; you're distributors, right? AEP. Yes. Okay. Well, let's say that again. You're not the source of power. You're not. So yeah. you're, you've got ready your coal burning fire or a plant, and and you're basically in the distribution business now, correct? So we're, we're still in generation. Are you? Um, yeah. This this specific <clears throat> line is transmission. Um, so we'll if you picture it like a system of, of roads and bridges, um, we're like the interstate. Um, so typically longer distances, higher voltages. We'll deliver to a substation that drops it down to your, your county city roads that will then del deliver to homes. So th this line specifically is transmission. Um, so, you know, higher voltages, 138. Will there just be, just be one transmission line at the top of this pole? Is yes. that correct? Yes. So um, there's, there's three arms. Each one of those is a circuit. But that, or that represents one, one circuit. So this is only one line. So, so like Megan said originally that we were looking into double circuit, um, there would be six arms at the top of this. I see. But the three, the three arms would all have uh, a transmission a wire on them. A wire yeah. on them. Yep. And, and um, in the, you're probably going to get to this when you go to options, but in these typical structures, are there options on the kinds of structures? Yeah. So Colors, I uh, materials, uh, there is. Design. Um, this, this is what we recommend. Um, staff has asked us to look into shortening the height of these poles a little bit. Um, so as proposed, the structure is 90 feet tall. So if you look at the, the middle arm and then the, the bottom arm, if you're looking at the top half of this pole, if that makes sense, um, basically we'll just make those parallel. So that'll shorten the, the pole about 10 feet. So we'll be looking about 80 feet above ground. So, and, and there are different colors. Um, I know staff asked us to look into an Atina finish that I think that they'll they'll touch on later, um, but we provided cost and, and recommendations for those. So there, there's four different um, underground options that staff asked us to look, in, look into. Um, we'll go over kind of high level maps to give you an idea, and then I'll break it down. There's aerials, um, and then a cost delta. Um, so. It, a AEP is is willing to pay what we would typically pay for construction. Um, we are not recommending underground here. However, if city feels that they would like underground, um, uh, the city would be responsible for any cost above what our typical construction would cost. Um, so these underground alternatives are going to report the, the differentials from a preferred overhead alignment. Both the overhead alignments are about the same length, um, so I'd anticipate about the same cost. Um, and, and again, any any cost delta above what our overhead power line would be, if the city would want to move forward with an underground option, um, we would consider it. But any any cost would be on the city. Joe, do you guys ever bury lines? We do, um, and, and typically it's distribution that buries lines. Um, uh, transmission voltages we do, but it's only when there's there's no other option for overhead. So, uh, given this area, unfortunately, I know there's there's concerns with visual impacts. Unfortunately, that, that does not mean that we can't do it. <laughs> what does it mean when there's no other <clears throat> options? What would an example be that there weren't other options that you would bury it? So I guess, you know, it, it would be nice if preference, if the cost was the same, but we have to justify our costs to, to PJM and, and, and FERC. Um, the rates are spread across, you know, other people, not just in this community. Um, so we need to make sure that, that when those folks are reviewing our, our costs of, of building power lines that, that were prudent with those dollars. Um, so in this example specifically, um, overhead is much cheaper. Um, so it, it wouldn't be prudent on our part to recommend underground. What would make it prudent to put on, what kind of scenarios make it prudent for you to put it underground? So th there's a number of factors, and typically it's, you know, it's every project's a little bit different. Um, but what, what makes us not prudent is that there's room to put an overhead power line. 
Um, so if you know, if you look in downtown Columbus, where there's absolutely no room, um, you know, then then our options have to we have to explore other alternatives. But so we'll go through the the four high level um, maps here. So black is showing um, the proposed route. Um, what you see highlighted in purple um, is the underground option that, that staff has asked us to look into. Um, so the first one here is showing substation to substation. Um, we can go to option two. This is showing right in front of the, the city of Dublin building to the west of Dari Fields and actually just to the west of one of AEP's existing transmission lines. Um, option three. Again, same starting point run front, right in front of uh, City Dublin building. This is going just to the east of Dari Fields. And then option four, starting right in front of the building again and ending just east of Cosgrave Road. You were talking about that's the portion that would be buried. Yes. And what's what's highlighted be... in purple would be buried. Everything Understood. else would be overhead. So in aerial, again, this is substation to substation. Um, we gave an estimated delta. Um, uh, Due to the, the amount of engineering that we have, this is the range that, that we feel the project's going to fall into. Again, this is substation to substation. Um, it, I do want to note that we've done a lot of work to get to this number. Um, we're pretty confident in it. But again, any cost, if, if this, any of these options are selected, any cost that's above what our typical construction would cost uh, would be City of Dublin. So I don't want to say these numbers are concrete, uh, but it's we have done some, some engineering and, and preliminary work to, to get to these numbers. I want to be perfectly, I just want so that the people in the audience understand that this is above and beyond, this delta is above and beyond the cost of construction of above ground. Exactly. Yep. Thank you. Yep. So what would be the average sort of cost per foot or how would you do that above ground versus below ground? Is there sort of a rule of thumb or is it terrain dependent or? So it, I, I hesitate to give a rule of thumb. <laughs> Um, just because depending on what utilities look like under roads, you know, it, it, there's so much variables that it, I wouldn't even, it, it, it can vary so much. That's why even this big of a range, um, once we get out and, and see what's, what's underneath the roads, um, it can vary. So I, I, I hesitate. So what, what the overhead cost in this instance would be, so what would we add on top of this to get sort of or subtracting this from the total cost. So what would be, I guess what I'm getting at is what would be the, if it was all above ground, what's that number? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't think I have the, the number. I just have the deltas pulled here. I don't have what our, what our construction is for our route um, or what the, the cost is. Um, but I, I can get that for you. How deep do you go on the underground? Um, but, you know, that's, that's a good question. Um, I'm, I'm asking my T line. I asked the question because if we were downtown, if we were in the historic district or other areas of Dublin, we have significant limestone that's very deep. So sure. depending on what you hit underground, it, it could be clearly at the top end of that delta. Yeah, and, and I know it can vary. Um, it, and given here, there's, there's some roundabouts planned for the area. So I know that we were considering going under. Um, so. You know, it's probably case by case basis, but I, I don't know if we have an average. So, but that that would be one of the factors that you're right contributes to cost based on you know, not just utilities, but what you're saying is you know what what does the sediment and soil look like. Um, so, but we would have to do a, a lot more engineering and field work to get to you know to figure that out. So, uh, option two. Um, this is again starting right in front of the City of Dublin building, ending west of Dari Fields. Um, so AEP has an existing transmission line that, that runs north and south along the west side of Dari Fields. Um, so we'd be popping up just to the west of that existing line, then heading north overhead straight into our substation. Um, so that this cost goes down. I mean, as you can see, this isn't the, the entire route being undergrounded. Um, go to option three. Um, starting right in front of your building and ending just east of Dari Fields. And this is, this is a little bit shorter. 
and then option four is ending just east of Cosgrave Road. So I, I think I have a picture following, following these four options um, that shows what, what our transition poles, we call these riser pole. So this is what these poles look like when you're, tra when you're transitioning from overhead to underground. Um, so just wanted to make sure that everybody was aware. Um, it looks a little bit different than, than the poles that, we'll, that we'd be constructing overhead. Do you know, Joe, the, the, back to the image, the typical structure slide, you don't have to go to it, but are there poles like that located throughout Dublin and other locations? They are. Um, now I know I've been working with staff a little bit. A lot of the a lot of the polls that that we've been or the pictures that we've looked through have been distribution. Um, this is like typical. Yeah, not not these ones, but the the picture that we we showed earlier. Um, these are typical polls that we're we're putting in um, all over the state and really all you know across the country. Um, and are these a replacement for those ones that have four? You know, four different ones that kind of look like a big radio tower like sort a lattice, of thing. Like lattice tower. Yes. Yeah, we are. We're, we're still using lattice towers, you know, given terrain, like mountainous terrain. Uh, but typically around here, it's, it's these monopoles. This picture was taken right off Morse Road um, in New Albany. Um, so this, I think we photoshopped it a little bit to be exactly what, what you'd be looking at along Shire Rings. Um, Joe, I have a question. Um, there are, like you said, there are other designs. Obviously, you can shorten a pole. You can color the pole. Um, I think I mentioned when you were here before, the one that New Albany has that yep. looks like an arch. Um, can, you, can you tell us if those choices are available to us, any of those choices? I mean, I know that you discussed different yeah. ones, but we only still see the same pole. Yeah. We yeah. do have a couple slides later on in the presentation that okay. address color and the bold structure that you had um, asked that we look into. Okay, so I didn't know that there was. Mm -hmm. yeah. There will be, and if, if after we go over that, if you have any more sure. questions, I'm, I'm happy to. That's fine. Thank that you. That poll that you showed from New Albany looked like it was significantly off the road. Uh, by the looks of things, I'm going to guess it was 40 to 50 feet off the road from the picture. How far? north of the road would you intend to put these poles? What we're looking at right now is about five feet outside of road right away. So I know we've had discussions so, about so I wanna, improvements I want to be that. not outside of, not off the pavement. Um, so out, outside of road right away, that's typical. Um, now if you look all the way down Shire Rings or some areas that are constrained, we may be a little bit closer to pavement. Um, Five feet's typical when, when we're playing a road outside. So if you say road five road. feet, how many feet does that mean off the edge of the pavement? Well, it, it varies based on how wide the road right away is. So every road's different. Do you know how wide the right of way is on In this Shire road? Shire Rings, I, I don't. Um, I think we've we just started surveying on the eastern portion. Um, we haven't got to the west yet. So once we once we define those, do you have to take any property? No. You just no. in the right of way all the way up the road. Yeah. So to get it farther away from the roadway, you'd have to do a take. Well, not, not necessarily. Um, so we're only looking at, um, let's see here, 80 foot wide right away. So what that means is the pole's in the center and then 40 feet easement on, on both sides. Um, so when we're by a road, 40 feet of that easement can be overhanging the road. Um, what we're worried about is, is trees going up into it, um, you know, buildings being built that, that impact our clearances that we have to meet. So. What is the building clearance on these lines? So I don't know the exact clearance. It, it gets pretty complicated, um, but that's generally 40 feet on both sides of the center line is what we're going to be looking to have clear. Center line of the power line or center line of the road? Center line of the power line. So if it's long Shire Rings, we'd be looking 40 feet north and 40 feet south. Actually, you would be you would be on the north side of Shire Rings, mm -hmm. theoretically, if that's how you yep. progress. So you would actually take up 80 feet of easement or right of way along the north side of Shire Rings. I say 40, feet. 40 feet to the north 40 side feet. of where our poles are. 40 feet to the south side. If you're hanging over the road, it could vary, right? Yeah. Okay. But just to be clear, it's all north of the of the roadway, north side. 
And you can use the whole of the road as overhang. So yep. you could be really close to the edge of the road. Yep. So, you know, that is a road that's probably subject to improvements and things. Mm -hmm. How does that work? What? So, so, that, so that's a big concern and why typically, like I said, five feet. And I, I, I don't want you to hold me to that because we don't have, you know, the, the locations engineered out yet. Um, but typically we'll go pri private easement. Um, so outside of road right away, so that the city still has room to expand that the expand the roads. So, Megan, do we have anything on infrastructure in the future for that that area? That we have shared address? our Shire Rings corridor plans. We've shared our existing engineer plans, all of the utility information that we have. So they have all of our engineering records and plans um, in their hip pocket that they can. But our going forward uh, discussions as well. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, th yeah, they'll, they'll absolutely have to be with, with all the development in the area, especially east of Avery where it's, where it's tighter. Um, there's going to be a lot of, a lot of coordination um, to make sure that, that everything works smoothly. So, Megan, you have some slides. Okay, Are you so done, Joe, with, with your that, portion? Thank you, Joe. Sure. Um, and Joe will be here for the remainder of the presentation. But with that, we're going to transition over to the staff presentation. We're going to start with Jennifer Radler, who's going to talk a little bit about City of Dublin's rights and all this, and also talk about the Ohio Power Siting Board process moving forward. Good evening, council members. I'm going to quickly summarize the process, and it's been alluded to several times already in the course of the presentation. Um, at the outset, I would say that Dublin's legal rights are pretty limited in this scenario. Um, AEP has certain rights to the line, to the properties that are being constructed, but we've been asked, what if AEP had to take land that belonged to the city? How can... AEP take anything from the city, what's the city standing? And just generally in Ohio, if there is an entity with eminent domain power, such as AEP, that entity can take from a second public entity like Dublin, uh, unless the property is essential to that second entity's business or the appropriation interferes with a public purpose to a material degree. So that would be the standard if AEP even had to go and acquire more property from Dublin. As you see, that's a pretty high standard and would be difficult to meet. Um, next, I'm going to talk about the application process. Um, so as AEP has alluded to, it sounds like they're planning on filing in February. Um, notification will have to be given to um, any affected city to all the properties that would be affected. Um, typically, an accelerated application is deemed automatically approved no later than 90 days after it's filed. The applicant only needs to, to explain one construction option, although they need to discuss other options that were considered and why this is the best proposed route. Um, again, needs to include a list of all properties and in the event that there is acquisition necessary as a result of the line construction, they would need to say where they were in um, status of negotiations with those properties. And again, providing notice to us, all the other affected governments, every property owner that would be affected, and then they'll have to publish in a newspaper. So Jennifer, what makes something accelerated versus not accelerated? So accelerated is they can take advantage of this process if there is a need for, um, for the project, a demonstrated need, and they're pretty much entirely in existing right-of-way. Um, and so there's a construction notice. Um, that's usually if they control all the other properties. But basically for something like this that's redundant, um, they would meet the qualifications for this accelerated process. So with regard to the approval process, um, any, there are several options for participation in the proceedings. Interested persons, including the City of Dublin, can file a motion to intervene, which is... Um, you can then participate in the proceedings, which again are limited, um, or can file comments. 
and those comments would be filed with the Ohio Power Siting Board, as has been referred to earlier in the presentation. That's going to be the entity with the approval uh, power for this application. And the comments would then become part of the record in the case. Um, the Ohio P Power Siting Board staff will conduct an investigation and will, will then file a written report with the board. Um, the staff report will contain an automatic approval date, and the only limitations on that is that approval date can't be any sooner than seven days after the written report is filed and no later than 90 days after the application is filed. The Power Siting Board can then approve, uh, approve with modifications, disapprove or take no action on the application. And if the board takes no action, then the accelerated application is deemed approved as of the date set forth in that staff report. And after that, the applicant can proceed with construction. So that's a summary of, again, accelerated process, limited review. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions. They haven't filed any of this yet? They have not. Any questions about that uh, part, Jane? Um, just uh, on the um, Ohio Power Siting Board, do um, you have a list of criteria as to how they judge yes. uh, whether they approve it or they disapprove it? So there are a list of approximately eight criteria. Um, I have not provide. I didn't provide those, but we can provide those if you'd like to review it. It's the same criteria that they would review if it were a regular application. So an expedited process, but still the same factors under review. Any other questions of Jennifer? Hearing none. Thanks, Jen. Okay, so as Joe mentioned, um, this is focusing on the overhead route options. AEP is considering these two route options. The first option would run, run straight along Shire Rings Road headed west um, from Emerald Parkway to Dari and then head north. The second route option would turn to the north along Eiderman Road and then head west just south of the land that's to be developed as part of the OU campus. So focusing in on the first route option, this is the option that would follow straight along the north side of Shire Rings Road from Emerald Parkway west to Dari Fields. This route would follow the existing distribution line east of Avery Road. So the existing distribution line is on the north side of Shire Rings Road, east of Avery in that section. And then if this route option were implemented overhead, the existing distribution line that runs along the south side of Shire Rings Road, west of Avery Road, would, as part of that implementation, would move to the north side of the road and follow along the new transmission line as we discussed. So one positive would be associated with that option would be that the um, existing distribution lines would move further away from the residential in that area and we would have a um, pole line that would be a little further to the north. The second route option from the east runs along Shire Rings Road all the way over to Eiderman Road, and then it would turn north along Eiderman Road, then it would turn west, and it would turn west just south of Nestle, and then continue west just south of the OU campus area over to the substation. So this route would follow the existing distribution line east of Avery, and then there's also an existing distribution line that follows Eiderman Road. So we pulled together some pictures and also did some Photoshop to prepare some graphics to help council and the residents um, give everybody an idea of the various options and what they would look like if implemented. So here's a look at the existing conditions on Shire Rings Road looking west and we're at Barron's Court Way looking west down the center of line of Shire Rings Road. How tall are the poles on the uh, left side of the road there as we, you okay. know how tall those are? 45, 50. You have those heights approximately? Does that sound right? Did they not know they were coming tomorrow? And just by comparison, 4550 one side, 80 the other? Yeah, so we'll have, we'll have a comparison photo. Um, so you can see that this is the existing distribution line that's along the south side of Shire Rings Road, and you can see the proximity of those poles and line to the residential areas. 
And then we photoshopped the transmission lines that are proposed for the north side of the road. And you can see that in this image, those distribution lines and poles along the south side are no longer there as part of this implementation of the overhead option. Um, so you can see that now the electrical infrastructure has moved to the other side of the road and it's further north and pulled away from the residential areas. And this is a side-by-side -side of those two graphics for easy comparison. Here's another look at the existing conditions on Shire Rings Road. This is a little further west than the previous pictures and we're closer down to Eiderman and this is still looking west at the center line. So those are the existing distribution lines. And then here's that same view at the same location with a photo illustration showing an estimate of what the same corridor would look like with the new overhead transmission line along the north side. So that includes moving the distribution over to the other side of the road following the new transmission line. And then this is a side-by-side -side view for easy comparison. Can you remind us, please, what's behind that, the, the fencing or the hedge on, the, on where the proposed blue line would go? I mean, on the north are those side of the road or the or south side of the road? I don't know, north or south, what we're looking at here. So this is looking west down Shire Rings Road towards Eiderman. Then south. So to the north we're side of the to north the south pole. A bit. <laughs> Typically, the north I'm saying we're, we're moving land. the poles from one side to the other, right? So it's moving mm -hmm. it away from uh, in this in this depiction from some of the residents. What is it moving it towards? What is behind those lines in both of those to the north? So it's right. field at this location. I think yes. that's undeveloped and land. And then headed right. down land. a little bit further west, we have the church, and then we have Eiderman Road. West. Of this is the church or east? Yes. Probably a lot less uh, parcels there of different property owners on that side versus the. Uh... Yes. And Megan, I have a question for you on the existing distribution line. There's quite a few lines there. Um, and on the, the new one, it, it just shows the new transmission line and a few distribution lines, but wouldn't you need to replace all the distribution lines? I mean, I'm sure that some of this is maybe cable and other, but wouldn't, wouldn't you have to use as many lines on one side of the road that exist and place them on the other? So as Joe walked you through that proposed poll, he talked about the top three arms are for the future transmission right. and the bottom two arms are for the existing distribution. Then he mentioned beneath that would be the cable and the telephone. So as far as counting up the lines, they were all, I mean, we had asked that question and AP had indicated that they were all accounted for on that image of their proposed poll. Okay, because we don't yeah, have any that. transmission lines on the left-hand side of the picture. Those are all distribution lines. Those are all distribution So are you able to condense the number of distribution lines on the new polls from what was on the existing poll? Is that what we're seeing? Because it looks to me like you have six, seven, eight maybe distribution lines on the south side of the street, but you only have three. So, so a lot of that is telecommunication, fiber, different things. Um, actual distribution lines, so what's actually has electricity in it, is shown double circuit on the left side, and we have that shown in the transmission on the right. Um, so I, I think, so those two structures shown in this picture are dead ends um, to, to support the tight angle that you can see taking a turn. So there's a lot of guy wires coming down, so it may look like there's, there's more wires than there are. Um, but our, the picture of the typical structure that we showed has all the distribution, all the transmission wires that are going to be on there. Um, we, we are open. We do have to be open for other telecommunication wires to be underneath. We did show a couple of them um, on that structure. But I think this looks like there's, there's more lines than there are just because it's... Well, there's 10. So the, the three at the very top that are in parallel, and then the three right underneath are the two circuits. So those are both the distribution circuits on the pole. So the bottom four are bottom others. Bottom four are probably telecommunication okay. other things, yep. And I presume that those bottom four would be moving. Those poles are coming down for sure, in other words. So, so there you will allow those bottom four lines to yep. Yep. 
to be on your lines. And there's, there's no um, loophole that a telecommunications or another poll, these are all your polls on the south side of the street. There's, because yeah. I know some polls are owned by certain companies and some polls aren't. So these would definitely come down where there would be no other polls left up other than the few that would be other, other routed to a, yep. okay. and probably an additional four lines would go on to the new, about another additional four lines. Do you lines. know if any of those are vacated? Are they all active? Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I don't know. Many times there's inactive lines up there. Paxton Cable was real active out here years ago, and they're gone. And they don't come back and take them down, uh, typically. So it's possible there's inactive. I'm, I'm sure we, yeah. So would you be responsible for removing those inactive lines if they don't belong to somebody anymore? I would assume so. When our poles come down, they, they would come down. <laughs> so when we're, when we're taking all these structures down, it would move to the north side of the road on the Chire Rings. We would transfer everything active, I'm assuming, based on, you know, I don't know but what agreement that we had with them. But if they're inactive, I would assume that we would, they, they would come down. Yeah, I think that was, is definitely something we'd like to know. Because to Jane's point, we don't really want there to be some excuse to leave them up. That, I agree. Yeah. Yep. The um, cadence of the poles, because they're at a higher elevation, <clears throat> I presume there's going to be a lot less poles. Is that right? Than existing distribution right is. Yeah. Than your current. Yep. Gaggle of wires, so yeah, okay. Yep. How far apart, just curious, how far apart are the new poles versus the old poles? So, I, I don't know what the span is of the, of the old ones, I know they're shorter. I think the new ones we're, we're looking at averaging about 300 feet apart. Okay. Okay, so continuing the discussion of the overhead transmission line option, we have been exploring other options for improving the aesthetics that would be associated with this option or reducing the or softening the visual impact of the proposed um, transmission line and associated poles. Some of the options that we have been discussing with AEP include um, one option that would be a Natina finish on the poles, and that's what... Um, was referenced earlier. So I'll show you a picture of that pole um, finish option next. Another option would be we could include landscaping um, as permitted underneath the lines to help soften the view shed or soften um, the appearance of the lines and disguise the lines a bit. Um, and we've had those discussions with AEP as well. Um, Councilmember Fox, you had shown us a picture of what AEP refers to as the bold structure. Um, so we'll have a slide showing what that structure would look like and a discussion about that. And then we've also talked about implementing or considering implementing a shared use path connection along Shire Rings Road between Avery and Emerald, and that would be an added amenity in that area, and we could leverage the construction of the pole line and the, and the um, power infrastructure to help save some costs with right-of-way associated with that connection. So first talking about the Natina finish, um, the cost of this appearance, so it ends up looking um, much like a wood pole. A lot of, there, there had been some questions about wood versus um, a steel pole. Some folks thought the wood pole has a more natural appearance. Um, this Natina finish produces a similar look to a wood pole. Um, and the cost of this Natina finish would be approximately 300000 for the entire route. And AEP has indicated that that entire cost would fall on the city of Dublin to absorb. Trees and landscaping. AEP's practice does not include landscaping around the poles. We have suggested to AEP that we would consider options to improve the aesthetics in the area. And as I said, soften the views in the area. Um, so we could consider planting some smaller trees that would be allowed um, that wouldn't grow up into the prohibited area of the lines. We could consider um, some bushes, and that would help beautify the area. Costs, there would be a range of costs associated with that, and those costs would fall to the city of Dublin. And then this is a picture of the bold structure. Um, it's called the Breakthrough Overhead Line Design, um, otherwise referred to by AEP as bold. Um, there, 
AEP has determined that these wouldn't be the best option for the situation that we have in Dublin for a number of reasons. The first being that it does provide for a wider footprint. And this um, picture of the bold pole shows two circuits in, over in New Albany. This line that we're proposing or that AEP is proposing in Dublin would only include a single circuit. So one arm of that bold structure would be occupied and the other arm wouldn't. So it wouldn't be balanced. Um, we wouldn't benefit from the efficiencies of the bold design. The bold design provides for longer spans, but because we would have the distribution underneath it, that would require additional distribution poles in between these pole structures or in between these bold structures. So Megan, that, that bold structure only really carries a transmission line is what you're saying. It doesn't carry distribution lines as yes. well. Yes, yes. So we would end up with bold structures that have a wider footprint, and then we would also have distribution poles in between. So it's, it's our thought that that would create a more cluttered look and actually have more of a visual impact than the proposed poles um, that AEP has shared. So a shared use path connection has been in the long-term plans for the city of Dublin as shown on the bikeway master plan. Um, the shared use path connection in this area has been shown along the south side of the road to connect some of the existing shared use path that you can see there in purple. Um, but we could leverage the construction of the overhead power lines and poles in this area and build that path connection along the north side of Shire Rings Road just underneath the pole line or the power lines. And that would save an estimated $90,000 potentially in right away and easement acquisition costs that would be incurred um, if we were building that project as a separate project. So here are some images of the eastern end of the project down towards Emerald Parkway. Um, so this is the existing condition looking west. Um, at the Emerald Parkway end of the project. This is around the development building to your right, and then we have a DACA to your left. You can see that those are the existing distribution lines. At this end of Shire Rings Road, those distribution lines are on the north side of the roadway. Um, the existing sidewalk, as you can see, ends about halfway into that picture, as well as the landscaping is, that's next to that sidewalk. And here is an image that we have photoshopped um, that is of the same view and it shows what the proposed transmission line and the pole that AEP is proposing would look like in this area. This would utilize the steel pools. And with a shared use path, you can see that we've extended the shared use path and also extended the landscaping in this picture. And then this is that same view with the extended path and the landscaping utilizing that Natina finish on the poles. So now we'll take a look at the overhead. So the portion of my presentation thus far is focused entirely on the overhead option. Now we'll take a look at the overhead option as it compares to the underground, the complete undergrounding of the entire line as it compares to the partial burial. And Joe outlined several options with different endpoints for the partial burial. So this is one slide that summarizes all three of those options, um, as well as the associated costs that um, would be borne by the city of Dublin, those incremental differences. So as I mentioned, AEP outlined um, several burial options ranging from the entire line down to several different partial burial options. Staff has been focusing on and generally um, looking at the possibility of burying the lines that would be proposed adjacent to the residential areas. And that would be between the service center and Dari Fields Park. That option, as Joe mentioned, um, brings a price tag of between nine and $14 million. Um, and these are very, very recent estimates. Staff literally just received these numbers late Friday evening. So we haven't had too much time to do cost comparisons um, and all that. But that cost would be borne by the city of Dublin. It would provide aesthetic benefits in that residential area along the route. The important thing to note, though, with the partial burial is that although the transmission lines would be buried in this area, those existing distribution lines would remain where they are along the south side of Shire Rings Road. 
Um, AEP has shared with us that they do not prefer the underground option and they really don't prefer having both overhead and undergrounding along the same line. So it is not pot, they don't bury distribution and transmission lines in the same areas. That was, the reason that the distribution lines wouldn't be buried is because they don't bury them together. You don't bury them together. Is that true? Yeah, I mean, I mean the big reason is because. Joe, if you could go up to the microphone, please. <laughs> sure. So not saying that those could never be done, but that would be something for, for AEP Ohio and, and distribution to consider. This project is only considering transmission. Um, so that, those, are, those are the costs just for transmission. Um, so that's, that's what we looked into. Um, not saying it's, it's never been done. But that's that's not what we considered. But what, but you're on the overhead. You're removing the old poles. I mean, uh, I'm just I'm curious as the reasoning there. If you if you have overhead and you're removing the distribution on the s south side mm -hmm. and putting them on the north side, if you bury them, wouldn't you do the same? Wouldn't you remove them and then? Well, the, the cost is a lot different. <laughs> It, it's a lot easier to, to take those poles down and move them to north side with their poles than it is to, to, to underground distribution. Okay. So if you did a partial bury, you would bury the transmission lines. You'd cross back over to the south side of Shire Rings for the remaining distribution lines that wouldn't be buried. So, you'd, so if you're traveling westbound on Shire Rings, sure. everything would be moved over overhead to the north side. Yep. Right? Then when you hit a point at which you would bury, you would only bury the transmission line. You'd come back across the street to the old poles for the distribution lines until you come then back across the street again once you've come back above ground. That, that would probably be the, the plan, yes. Thank you. So the transmission line to be buried would be, we were looking at in-road right away. Um, so where, where we do have overhead, I'm, I'm sure we would still consider bringing distribution to the north side. Um, where we went underground, it wouldn't make sense to, to bring distribution. So, so you would consider still moving all of the distribution lines to the north side, even if you're partially burying? Or no, it would be just what I said before. What, for what you said first. I so, see. So where we have overhead poles, I'm sure if we, if we explored an underground option, we would still consider moving distribution to the north side of Shire Rings. Oh, if you, where we are overhead. I gotcha. So even if we paid, so even if we pay, whatever your biggest, hugest number, $32 million, let's say we paid $32 million to bury all the new stuff the whole way, yeah. all this old stuff on the south side of the street would still be there? Yes. That's all distribution. So part of the reason why we recommend overhead, because underground is so expensive. <laughs> I mean, I'll be honest, I never, I drive my kid down to play in Dari Fields for the last 10 years playing baseball. I never noticed how significant those poles and all those, I mean, there's a lot of wires and a lot of poles. Yeah. And we're going to have that no matter what we do. Yeah. No, unless we go overhead on the north side. Right. right. No overhead on the north side, but if we're going to spend the money, which they pay for overhead. Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. You don't have to pay for that, except for the That's free. patina and the coloring mm -hmm. and all that stuff. But overhead, you would pay for in which case all of this would go away. Oh, but if right. we bury it, we get this ginormous bill and we get to still have those lines. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So Did you want to add that, something? So there's not a possibility to bury, I mean, that would be another conversation with AEP. Exactly. There's got to be significant in, contractual arrangements between you and the, uh, the other distribution lines between whether it's cable or fiber or what, whatever, whatever those lines are carrying. I mean, you, you're giving them, they're paying you for the right to put those up probably along the way. Yeah, and we're required to, to allow them to do it. By the governmental authorities or whatever, but nevertheless, they still have to pay you. So there's got to be agreements that say if you have to move the line, they have to go with you. Yes, yeah, typically. Yeah, I'm sure there's a number of agreements out there, but, but yes. Yeah. So if you're paying the money to bury the part of them, is it not um, physically feasible to bury them together or is the hurdle here an, another agreement with another agency? I mean, is it technically possible? 
So that goes into the. Can we get the, your name for the record. I'm sorry. I'm Jessica Howley, um, transmission you, line engineering manager for Ohio. Um, so when we go to underground, there are a lot of factors that go into play of the duct sizes that we need. And what we look at specifically was transmission cables only. So when you add distribution into your same duct bank, you have some reliability concerns and your costs go up because you have heat factors that, that go into it. So we get into a lot of details on the engineering side. We do not typically, I um, cannot think of a situation where we have done transmission and distribution in the same duct bank. Um, it, it causes concerns for us. We're two different systems when we go underground and we, we keep it that way for the um, system reliability there. So some clarification on when we were talking routes. We have put our design together to follow some of the distribution routes that are out there because that is an, a current corridor. We try and lessen our impact there. Um, where we get into the park, distribution would not follow anymore they don't, they go underground to serve one of the park buildings, but they don't need to continue down that line to where our 345 KV line is. So we have worked closely with our distribution counterparts to ensure that we have an understanding of where they need to be, how we lessen the impact in the future. So we, that's why we talk about two circuits. Um, it may not immediately be used because it down Eiderman, um, they see some need for it later. Uh, right now, there's a, a one circuit there. So we are working with them to ensure that we are looking at the routes that they would need. If they are not there and they don't have a need there, we would not have them in our future design. Does that clarify a little bit? Them being what? Them being distribution. So their circuits or the circ So after Cosgray, distribution has no need to follow us down our corridor through the park. Where do they go? They go underground and serve, um, they go up Cosgray, up to the north, um, up Cosgray, and they also serve the, one of the park buildings underground. So the park building is, is like a lateral from the distribution line into your home. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just a long one, but it's, it's like, it's just a lateral. And the park sort of buildings, the buildings in Dari. In Dari Fields, the correct. restrooms. And right. may even go to the water tower there, too. I'm not sure if it does that, but it might. So we have, in general, when we are looking at these routes, when we put distribution under build, we work with them to figure out what routes they actually need and that will have a future use for them. So we just, we're not just putting it there to make it easy. We're actually working with them and refining those designs. Can I ask you a question? Um, maybe go back to that slide, Megan, that has the landscaping of, um, where the, that one. Um, these poles have to be 40 foot on, you have 40 foot of easement on either side. They're centered on 40 foot on either side. Is that correct? You have to have that kind of a clearance. So these pictures were not um, completed by, by AEP. So these were something that, that Dublin put together just to give you an idea. This is not where we would be on the side of the road. So, so I'd be curious. I think that's an, I mean, obviously, this is primarily about aesthetics and the concern about transmission lines closest to properties. So um, how close they are to the road makes an impact aesthetically, how far away they are from the road, how far away they are from houses. So can you give me an idea of what would be an accurate placement of? On the other side of the sidewalk. Be on the other side of the sidewalk. Yeah. So <clears throat> by being on the other side of the sidewalk, tree plantings at least could be unobstructed views and then um, these would be how far off on the other side of the sidewalk, would you say? So I do not know the, the um, right-of-way went through here, um, so I don't want to give you a wrong number, but we would be on the, on the private easement, on the uh, out-of-road right-of-way. Okay. And the 40-foot the clearance would start from the center of the road, at least? It would start at the center of the poles. The center of the poles, and it can overlap as far as the farthest side of the pavement on the road is that when you say overlap clearance can overlap so when we talk about this 80 foot corridor and it mm -hmm. being centered on our poles it means that we are taking easements wherever there are private easements so if we are five foot inside of the private easement then we will take up we will and take is not the right word 
it, we will acquire easement rights for um, up to the road right of way and then the existing 40 foot into that. So it could be 45 if we're five feet off the road right, right of way, five feet plus that 40, 40 foot. What happens if there's an existing structure there? So we work to design around that. Um, we also work closely with our right-of-way agents to determine what we need to do. It's, it's not a black and white case. So if it's designed around that, could you they're not exactly two hundred feet apart? Correct. Correct. We have some um, different designs, different um, options to be able to help mitigate some of those those things that we, we come across. So are all of these issues contemplated before your February filing date with the Ohio Siding Board? We have looked closely at the center lines that we have proposed to know that they are constructible. Because I think it would be important, I don't want to speak for all of my fellow council people, but I think it would be important for us to know just where these poles are going to be um, before we made decisions on should they be above ground? Should they be below, below ground? Is the poles on the south side? You know, or, you know we, we really need to understand the risk reward. That's not the right phrase, but you know what I mean, of, of what that's going to be. So I really feel like it is incumbent upon you to tell us where exactly are these going to be? Because I would imagine prior to submitting to the Ohio Siding Board, you have to have that figured out. We do, and, and we have to be 100% accurate when we submit, so, so you're right. The, the problem gets is we have a pretty good idea, like 80%, um, but in order to get to the 100% to submit the siting board, there's a lot of money in engineering that needs to be spent. Um, so it, it wouldn't be prudent on our part to get to that point and then go down a different path. Well, I hope you understand that it wouldn't be prudent on our part to make a $32 million sure. decision based on, uh, you know, best guesses or you sure. know so, clo so. closest estimates right and if you're at 80 percent now yeah, i guess i'd I just, rather I threw, see I a number out but I, I think we can get let's closer. say roughly you're at 80 percent i'd rather see that and have a pretty good rough estimate of where those poles are going to fall than today which is i don't have any idea how big the right of ways are that's you, you see what i'm saying so to chris's but, point sure. for us to try to make decisions like that based on a meh don't really know that like then no the pole's not going to go there that's a real challenge for us. You know, it's it's our job to make sure we're listening to the residents, and clearly aesthetics are are a big issue here. And so, if that's the case, I'd rather have that eighty-ish percent, you know, certainty on where those poles are going to go, so we can take a look at what that means. Sure, and and I think so. If you're picturing these poles being just outside of the sidewalk, part of that can be negotiated or talked about after we select a route. Um, I think I can probably get you something a little bit more accurate. Um, definitely before the December 2nd meeting. Um, Particularly, so. you know, in the areas adjacent to the residents. I, I realize we sure. have some existing structures further to the east yep. that the lines, the poles may be required to be closer to the road because of that additional 40 feet. Yep. Um, you know, but maybe when we get to some of these areas that are undeveloped land, we could, you know, if they were going to be 40 feet off the edge of pavement, we could put a you know, walkway on one side of them and, and landscape, you know, on the one side of the walkway and have the poles on the other, make them patina finish, do the planting. That, that, that probably would be a very different conversation. But I, I don't know that there's a whole lot more feedback we can give you until you give us some, you know, some solid information that, you know, we, we want to be sensitive to the neighborhood. We want to get as many poles down as we possibly can and put as few up as we absolutely have to. Um, or Barry, what, um, but, it, you know, that doesn't sound like it's going to be real viable if we have to leave the lines on the south side of the roadway. So I, I guess we, we need yeah. better information. Yeah. If, so we need so to make generally I'll, I'll work on getting something more accurate as far as a picture. And yeah. Pictures sometimes do a little bit more than, than telling you. Um, but if you picture where your road right away ends, so it's not where the pavement is. Um, so, and, and I should know where, you know, how wide the road is on Shire Rings or the right of way, but five feet off that sidewalk. I mean, I'm sure that sidewalk's in, in road right away unless you took private easement for it. But. And we need 30 days before you submit to the 
siting board to make our decisions on whether or not we'll go underground or overground because we decision. need to figure out if we can lay out a footpath, you know, a multi-use pathway and what kind of landscaping we could do. We would need some time to present to the public and say, okay, they say they're going to go right here. These are the things that we can do. You know, we, we, we need to be able to communicate with them so that they know exactly what to yeah, react to. If we select an option, I think we can we can work through all those details as far as aesthetics and exact placement. Well, I, I think the other thing is is that one of the things I didn't see in here is if we choose a partial berry option, what that's going to look like during the course of that partial berry. Because it sounds like we're not going to get rid of those poles on the south side mm -hmm. during that time where the other where the other side's being buried, the transmission lines are being buried. Right, and so to have a visual of that, I think would be really helpful, so that the residents can see what that looks like versus what all overhead looks like versus what they have today. We get rid of this. I don't think we ever get rid of the south poles when we bury the south poles. Yeah, there. there's no, that's, that's what I mean, though. Like ever, right? But well, we don't need much on that because it's not going to change. It's you're going to have exactly what you get. No, and that's what it will look aesthetically different because you're going to if you do a partial bury, you're going to have some that are overhead and some that are underground, and they're going to be crossing the road, which they don't do today, so it will look different. Well, I don't think underground's a, a good choice, to tell you the truth. When I saw the, the visuals on across the road, you're not solving any problems with clutter. At the end of the day, it sure looked a lot cleaner. Well, one of the questions is, have we had discussions with AEP about burying the um, distribution lines? I mean, has that been, we're saying that they don't technically do them in the same pole. Yeah. Are they, can they be next to each other? I mean, what have you done in the past when they've been buried and, and how did you work out that process? So they can be in general areas. I mean, it, it doesn't mean that they can't go down um, the road right of way as well. So it's just a matter of working out that design. We have had initial conversations with AEP Ohio. They asked specifically if you have additional conversations uh, questions about that to reach out to them. Um, they ask that we not get into those details here since we are not distribution experts. Megan, have we had conversations with them? Not at this point. We've been meeting directly with transmission folks. So we wouldn't know how that could look, what that would cost. We well, would, the number we would don't probably have be sense. similar because they're going to, I'm assuming they're shielding issues is what the problem is with the transmission and the distribution, you need to shield them from one another. Yep. So, the, so the cost would be double, Dana? Well, I, th I think generally uh, we know, based on our own experience, what it has cost to bury distribution as part of road projects. So we probably have some order of magnitude, but, you know, everything is, it, that can shift a lot depending on, you know, the intricacies of the site or what have you or conditions. But, um, I mean, generally speaking, on a cost per mile basis, but that would be a, on a cost per mile in addition to and above the burial of transmission. I, I don't know that you'll get much of economies of scale or efficiencies in that burial because really at the end of the day, as was mentioned, those have to be buried separately. You may have to bury them where they are on the, on the south side of the street versus the north side or however. I, we're not sure how those could be laid in. But. So we would, we would realistically, if, if we were to look at this presentation to say what it would cost to bury, those numbers would be close to double uh, to remove Well, dis distribution is a, is a little bit, is less expensive than transmission. In my, I won't speak for AEP, but, but you'd have or, in my own experience, distribution is less expensive than transmission, but it's still expensive. But um, the shielding but might add, that, that might be a significant change. Correct. Yep. And then the, the other issues are, then you would probably have to lay additional conduit uh, you could for the um, telephone cable and internet service providers. Um, and we have done that in some right of ways in new construction as well. Um, and depending on how they route it out in this area, there may be other ways they can go. But if there's not a pole there, there's no place for them to hang. So then they have to either reroute or uh, go underground as well. So I'm hearing all this. I'm starting to worry about timing. You guys have the ability, I would assume, to go to the power siding board, and you don't give one hoot about what we say about that. You could go to the power siding board and pursue approval and put this in, and there's nothing we can do to stop you. 
Well, yeah. I mean, I mean, we do care. That's why we're here today. No, I understand. I mean, don't get me wrong. What I'm saying is this process is in addition to the process you have, which is to go to the power side. Board, and you don't have to wait for our agreement because we're the ones attempting to adjust or to tweak your plan, which, I, I, again, right, I greatly right. appreciate your willingness to even to cooperate. I'm just thinking in my mind, if you guys are thinking about February, we have one more council meeting, right, this year. I mean, how do we try to... And I, and, I, and I get, Joe, all the effort and, and Jessica, what you guys have gone through to cooperate and, and work with not only our community but our staff and all that. We greatly appreciate that. I'm just trying to get my head around the timing of all this and all the concerns that are sort of percolating around mm -hmm. here. And the new numbers, I think they said they got. Yeah, our, our primary right. focus tonight was to really come together with AEP and share this kind of information because it has not been shared previously that I'm aware of. We were working with them to try to get an understanding of the order of magnitude of this cost, and there was a point at which we thought we were at about five to six million dollars, and you know, I would have said, "Hey, let's really pursue that burial op partial burial option." But those numbers have gone up um, quite a bit from there, which so we're at a much higher number than I thought we were at originally. As, as we've gone down this road and tried to try to understand, and they've done more finite engineering as a result. Uh, we've gone back and forth on how to make the all these things you've seen has been part of the, the discussion. We've talked about distribution, distribution burial, shifting of distribution. We've had these conversations with them uh, over the last couple months and, of course, taking the input from our residents, which we really appreciate, uh, and just trying to figure out a way to, to work this out together. Um, it, it's a tough one to solve. So but that's where we are, and this is the information we wanted to share tonight. Uh, I don't have a recommendation for you tonight. We still have to go back and look at if you were going to take on this order of magnitude, how would you go about paying for it? What would those impacts be on your other capital capital projects that you have uh, underway and so forth? So those are those are the decisions. That we well, and it, I think it's really important for the 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 people interested in this topic to understand the process that we're going through. I mean, it is most decisions that we go through don't get this much due process. I mean, if this has been a tremendous amount of working in public input and all that and this work session that we came in to have is designed to do that to get out information and, and, and to keep the conversation going and there will be a point at which before whatever body this uh, decision this body makes on this issue there will be opportunity for public comment and testimony and, and all kinds of things which we were not intending to do tonight we wanted to hear from you guys and the staff and get the information out there now for the people who have joined us, there are comment cards out in the lobby, and I can assure you, although I would probably think, oh, yeah, who's going to pay attention to that? We actually do. Um, if you fill out your comment cards and, and get it back to our staff, it gets distributed to all of us, and you know how to find us through email and other sources, so we, we are definitely sensitive to the concerns of our community and, and what you guys are dealing with. I mean, you're here trying to do the right thing, right? Yep. Keep power to the, to the community and economic development and everything else. So. These are all uh, noble goals that we're trying to get to be able to live next to each other and, and work. So this was designed to do what we did to get this information out here. I think the numbers are new. Um, I'll be honest, I didn't realize that even burying, to Christina's point, even if we buried some, there's still going to now be some on the south side of the road that are still there. So um, that was new information for me. So I, I appreciate all of that information. And you know, we'll digest all of this. I am just concerned. and and. It would be nothing but just cooperation on your part that, you know, you guys aren't just going to say, well, you guys took too long. You know, we got a job to do. We have a mandate. We needed to do what we're going to do. And, you know, I'm sorry, but we're going forward. We don't want that to happen. So we sure. appreciate your participation, your cooperation. I hope you can sort of continue to bear with us as we try to try to sort this stuff out. Because, you know, and to Chris's point as well, we, the, that this road, the stretch of Shire Rings, has much different character at different places along that road. Um, you know, up up towards uh, Emerald Parkway, it feels more industrial-ish. You know, and then once you get past Avery, now it starts to feel more residential, and there's more residences. So we have to be sensitive to all of those existing conditions as they're found. And and this body, I've been a part of it for quite a while, is pretty receptive, um, and we'll step up and and do the best that we can do. So I. General, other than that, I mean, is there? Uh, well, and I, and I know we focused on that Shire Rings Road route primarily uh, in trying to show visuals and the like, um, and and there's still the other route, so all that's still under consideration. Um, 
but we were trying to focus on how could that look differently with the distribution and so forth. There's, um, you know, there's there's a singular pole line going up um, Ironman Road, but that was put in strictly for a fiber optic uh, and nothing else. Uh, so that so that visual wouldn't have made much sense to anybody. This one this one at least shows the differences that we were trying to, mm -hmm. to articulate. And and again, that was half apologize to the AEP folks. We wanted to try to create a visual and didn't mean to mislead anyone on where poles would be placed and all that kind of stuff, but but we needed to try to show people what that might look like. So, you know, And it's in a process. It's an evolution of information. And again, we really appreciate your cooperation and your patience. And to the residents in the neighborhood, I can tell you, like I said, I've been around this group of people for a very long time and they are hearing your concerns and we will just do the absolute best we can to make the best decision possible. So. I guess we'll leave it at that, and, and unless anybody else, Jane, you got anything to? No, I just have one question. Um, in looking at the two routes, because you'll need to know at what point which route you're pre I know you ha you're presenting, uh, assuming you're presenting the Shire Rings Road to Bouchard as your preferred route, and the Eiderman and across as the alternate route. Is that what you'd be presenting? So, so this one's a little bit different. Again, this is one of the accelerated applications. So we're just going to present one route. Which route board. is that then? Is the share? So we're, we're still evaluating between the two. You don't know yet. No, but I will tell you a lot of comments directed us away from from Shire Rings on the west side. So the, a lot of suggestions to keep the route as far north as possible, but but we're still evaluating. There's a lot of a lot of things to consider. And, and that's the question I, I just wanted to ask staff with um, the uh, interest in developing the West Innovation District. Um, is there any conversation that you'd like to share with council about the routes that you believe would be the less impactful to our residents plus the future of the district? Do you have a preference? Well, I wouldn't say we have a preference at this point. I think they're all impactful. I don't think I don't care which way you go; they're impactful. Um, certainly, more sensitive to the impact on on residents. But you're going to hear, I think, the same from anyone who has owns land or even has the future possibility of developing land as well. Even if something's not there, so in that respect, you're in a pickle no matter which way you go. So, uh, if, if that makes sense, so we don't have a preferred route either at this time. I, I would tell you if we thought we could bury, do a partial burial, the cheapest partial burial direct route would be straight down Shire Rings Road just because it's, you know, the, the shorter distance between two points is a straight line. So at least that's the last geometry I took. But, um, but that's that's what we would do if we could bury it and it would be out of sight and and not affect the residents that way would be our would be the preference and that's that's why we kind of focused on that if we if we did a burial route because it's just shorter and therefore it would be less expensive not by a lot but, but a little bit less expensive so. does the Eiderman option change the ability to do anything with the distribution lines at all or no. would they stay the same no change in so once we turn up Eiderman everything west would stay the same So regardless of option, unless it's buried, no, regardless of options, unless it's moved. What, what's existing will stay. What existing will stay. Thank you. So from a time frame, Dana, what can everybody expect, like Joe, or anybody? What's the next thing to be watching for on this topic? So, so I, I can go. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but um, we, we are tight. Um, we're in order to file with the siting board in early 2020 we need to, to pick a route to start engineering um, I know we, we met two weeks ago and kind of went with staff and went over comments that we were hearing um, they asked us to look into those underground options so so we did do a lot of work in those two weeks I think that's you know the, the city even asked us to, to look into doing a simulation for those for those polls for you but it, we didn't have enough time um, so it, we're tight um, but, but we do want to work with you. We do want to minimize impact to, to the community. Um, so we're a little bit flexible, but we, we, don't, have a, we don't have a ton of time. Yeah, well, we continue to work with them as we have been. And, and as Joe even mentioned, if, if we could, I, I think one of the key things would be, I think irregardless of the route you take, if it were to stay above ground, um, how, as the question came out earlier, if you really were able more specifically to lay out that easement or right-of-way space, relative to the road, relative to the shared use path, relative to maybe some, and I know landscaping doesn't hide a pole, but it, 
create does create a visual effect and it does have an effect so every little bit helps uh, and then you put the pole line behind that now maybe you're even getting further away but I don't know how that affects center line versus acquisition and that and cost and so forth so that that would have to be looked at as well so I uh, you know all I could say is well, we could work together to try to turn that around as quickly as possible and try to get back to you by December 2nd if we or just your next Second. council. So meeting. yeah, so the next council meeting is December 2nd. So anyone interested, keep their eyes open for the agenda. Yeah, we'll certainly get that information out um, as we have been about uh, noticing the meeting. So you all know that there is a meeting and and that we'll be revisiting this. We don't leave anybody out. So we'll Dana, I would also like to add. I think it's important for the multi-use trail path to the landscaping and <clears throat> patina poles and I, I think that that is is a value add so when when that comes back if we could make sure that that's in there that would be helpful yeah yeah we'd certainly do that I think too it's important and I want to um, say this to the public um, I think council would like to hear I know um, as I look at this aesthetics is everything when it comes to what the road looks like it's been a real concern and the distance um, I would like to hear on your comment cards as you've looked at these options um, what you think, uh, whether or not um, if we do an, if we do underground and you're still and you're still caught with uh, distribution lines down the north side. I mean, if it's about aesthetics, we want to hear what those options would be. And I think, as Chris said, um, I feel as if if we could do the the piece that the city could do and and making that patina something that would be uh, more attractive and uh, say that we would commit to a shared use path and that we would do landscaping to do the best we could to make that an attractive boulevard. I'd like to hear your comments on those thoughts. So um, I ask you to jot it down on your comment card. Thanks. And, you can, and it is never our intention to cut off people's participation. Work sessions, typically, we don't take testimony. But at a city council meeting on this, with it, this being on the agenda, we will. So you can come up and tell us whatever it is that's on your mind, and you can contact us between now and then and let us know what's on your mind, and we will listen to what you have to say. So thank you, Joe and Jessica. Thanks to all the AE people, <laughs> AEP people that came in. Thank you, Jennifer and Megan, for our staff stuff and Dana. Uh, with that, we are going to take about a 10-minute break to reconfigure, I don't know, this camera stuff. Five-minute break. We're taking a we're taking a five minute break before the council meeting starts.
Good evening, everyone. I will call the Dublin City Council meeting of Monday, November the 18th to order. Anne, would you please call the roll? Yes. Here. 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 It is my understanding we have the members of Troop 185. Is that all you guys? Just nod your heads if you're with Troop 185. Uh, I would greatly appreciate it if you guys could all uh, lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Come forward. Yeah, why don't you guys come on up here? Come on up. Let's everybody come up here. The flag is back here. Pledge of allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands. One nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So what brings you guys in? Is anybody sort of a designated spokesman here? All right, how about you? You be the spokesman. Go over there where that microphone is and sort of tell us what brings you in and what you guys are all about. Uh, your name? And your, say your name. Uh, I'm Andrew Hayden. So we're doing communications merit badge, some of us, and com community in the nation or something. Great, yeah. Okay. Citizenship. Bye-bye. Okay, fantastic. Well, thanks for coming in. We really appreciate you guys being here. Well, I know that uh, most of us participated in our very uh, special corporate resident, Wendy's 50th birthday, and I think Mary Shell and Blair Luciano, where are Mary? Mary, are you back there? Blair, come on up. We spent some time with them last uh, Friday, we have a proclamation here for you guys, and then we're going to put you on the spot. Uh, whereas on November 15, 1969, Dave Thomas opened the first Wendy's restaurant at 257 East Broad Street in Columbus, Ohio, naming it after his eight-year-old daughter, who was nicknamed Wendy, and, and it culminated a dream that Dave had since he was eight years old. And whereas from day one, Wendy's motto has been, quality is our recipe, and 50 years later, Wendy's mission is still the same to craft delicious quality hamburgers made from fresh, never frozen beef and to serve them fast in a clean and comfortable environment. And whereas Wendy's continues to uphold Dave's values, quality is our recipe, treat people with respect, do the right thing, profit means growth and give something back. And whereas on July of 1992, Dave Thomas established the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption, a public charity with one goal, to help, help every child in foster care find a permanent loving home. And whereas through its tremendous support of the Wendy's Wonderful Kids program, Wendy's continues to commit to achieve Dave Thomas's vision that every child has a permanent and home and a loving family. And whereas 1,000 children in Ohio are now in loving, adoptive homes due to the work of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption and the Wendy's Wonderful Kids program. And whereas what started as one restaurant now spans the globe with more than 6,700 locations and is proudly headquartered in Dublin, Ohio, and whereas Wendy's remains committed to providing great value, investing in quality food, delivering exceptional service, and elevating its restaurants with the aim to becoming the world's most thriving and most beloved restaurant brand. Now, therefore, I, Gregory S. Peterson, Mayor of the City of Dublin, Ohio, on behalf of Dublin City Council, do hereby congratulate Wendy, the Wendy's Company on 50 years of outstanding achievement in the City of Dublin and wish the Wendy's Company and its employees continued success signed this 18th day of November, 2019. There's another one for your wall. Good to see you. Well, um, my name is Mary Shell. I'm Chief Public Affairs Officer for the Wendy's Company, and Blair Luciani also works on our team. She's manager um, of public affairs as well. I've been with the company for 25 years, had the privilege of working regularly and closely with Dave Thomas. So on behalf of Wendy's, we want to formally thank the city of Dublin and all of you for your tremendous support. Dublin is, wouldn't be Dublin without Wendy's. Wendy's wouldn't be Wendy's without Dublin. And I believe, uh, Mayor, at our meeting last week, you mentioned that when Wendy's broke ground on our corporate headquarters, uh, there were a 1,000 people living in the Dublin area. So I think it's been very exciting for us to grow with the city as well. And hopefully we've contributed to some of your success. We certainly had um, really a big week last week. Every uh, week that year, we celebrate Founders Week to remember our beloved founder, Dave Thomas. And this year, it culminated on November 15th, which was our actual 
50th anniversary of our founding, the first day uh, the restaurant opened downtown. Um, I'm also chairman of the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. And as you mentioned, yes, we just had our 1,000th Ohio adoption as a direct result of our foundation and in particular uh, a cause and a program called Wendy's Wonderful Kids. Um, because of Wendy's Wonderful Kids and its growth, we are happy that you know that the foundation is um, going to headquarter back here in Dublin. They've bought uh, a new building. It's being renovated and we certainly appreciate the city's support for that as well. The foundation also is 25 years old and um, we are on track, we believe, in the next year or so to achieve our 10,000th adoption. We're singularly focused on foster care adoption in the U.S. and Canada. And so again, because of your tremendous support, we're able to grow, the foundation's able to grow. We call Dublin home and we deeply appreciate your commendation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mary Blair. Do you have anything to add, or are you just going to ditto? I'm just here for moral support. You must just here for moral support. Uh, you know, Wendy's represents all this good about our corporate residents, and it is such a fan. I mean, just think about that. A thousand children have been adopted because of your efforts. I mean, that. It, I mean, hamburgers are good. Don't get me wrong, but um, a thousand loving homes is, is at a totally different level of success. The Right now, we're selling Frosty Key Tags, so for $2, you can buy a Frosty Key Tag at any Wendy's. Um, it's good for free Frosties for the entire year, and all proceeds go to support the Dave Thomas Foundation for Adoption. So more Frosties means more adoptions, and mm -hmm. we encourage you to give that a shot. Wow, that's fantastic. Where do you go? Can you get that at any, any restaurant? Any restaurant. You buy a key chain. It's a key tag that goes on your key chain. Key um, tag. When you... Or, with purchase, with purchase, you um, <laughs> show them show them your frosty key tag, and it's always good for a free small frosty. And That's right. You talk about putting your money where your mouth is. That is really a commitment <laughs> and an investment um, in what matters. Yeah. You know. Anybody else, Mike? <laughs> we can set you back if you put one I'll of those take, out. I'll take that back to our marketing team and see. <laughs> maybe during National Hamburger Month in May, we could come up with something like that. But. <laughs> it is such, and when they ran the tape of your um, annual meeting, was it in September? Mm -hmm. Was it down in Florida? Mm -hmm. Where was it? It was someplace warm. Really fantastic. Such a professional organization. I mean, it, it, is, it is top shelf. There's nobody better than a, a corporation the way you run your business. And the employees are so, so, they are so into it. And it is a really fantastic place. Wendy's is 95% owned and operated by franchisees, and we're very proud of that as well. A franchise organization means... Lots of men and women have the chance to own their own business and be part of a, a bigger system. So we're proud to be the largest franchisor in Ohio and, to again, to be here in Dublin as our home. It is absolutely fantastic. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming in. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Very Thank you. Now, if we could have the uh, Dublin Jerome High School girls tennis team come forward. Where are you all? And coach, maybe you could introduce yourself and your champions here to us. Sure, it'd be, uh, be my pleasure. Um, first off, definitely want to thank uh, Ms. Marin City Council for uh, allowing us to come in. Also, uh, Nancy Richardson um, for arranging this as well and taking time out of your busy agenda to uh, acknowledge us here. Um, behind me here, I have um, four special ladies. Uh, these are uh, members of our uh, tennis team. Um, the team as a whole uh, went 18 and 1. Um, this season, and um, we had we were OCC champs for the 16th straight season. And uh, for those of you doing the math, Dublin Jerome has been open 15 years, and this is our 16th season of play. So every year that uh, Jerome has been uh, in existence, the girls' tennis team has won the OCC title. Um, and uh, all seven people so got to four. Give, the other teams have to be so tired of you. Guys. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They're, they're, we realigned this year, and I know oh some of the team. We had most of the teams still stay in it, but some of the teams that got out of it were probably pretty happy. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, we had seven girls. These four plus three of their teammates. Uh, also, seven uh, girls make up the whole starting uh, lineup for a match, and so all seven were voted first team. Uh, all OCC. Uh, these four behind me, what made these uh, ladies so special is uh, we finished first and second uh, in the states for the state uh, title for doubles. Um, taking the state cha championship uh, was uh, 
Lala uh, Nagaretti, uh, Lalasa Nagaretti, and Arya Dudapala. And then the runners up uh, were seniors, uh, Reagan Reeser and uh, Catherine Wong. Um, last year, we, I believe, we set a record where we had three, um, you, you enter three singles participants in the state tournament, and all three of our singles uh, players made it to states. Um, so we were wondering what we were going to do to top that. And uh, so we decided to be greedy and take the first and second places uh, in, uh, in doubles this year, which is, uh, doesn't happen too often. It's happened before, but it doesn't happen uh, all that often. So, um, and again, these four are just a, a great representation uh, of not only uh, Dublin Jerome, but of the city of Dublin as well. And we stress that all the time, that every time that they're playing and, and out, that they're not only representing themselves and their coach and their families, uh, but also uh, the city as well. And uh, I don't think you'll find four better student ambassadors than, than these four behind me. That's fantastic. And did you, can you introduce each one of them again? Sure. Go uh, right going in order, Reagan Reeser, Catherine Wong, Lala Sanagaretti, Arya Dudapala. And you have, if I would have handed you my proclamation, you basically covered everything that was in here. So I'm not oh, going to duplicate thanks. efforts and read it again. <laughs> but um, I do have a proclamation for you on behalf of City Council. We're so proud of you and your team and what, what you represent and hard work and dedication and commitment and success, ultimately. Which doesn't necessarily always flow all together, and, and it did in your case. So uh, we have this proclamation. We wish you our uh, deepest congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you for coming. I'll read the now here one. <laughs> he just... Now, therefore, I, Gregory S. Peterson, Mayor of the City of Dublin, Ohio, on behalf of Dublin City Council, do hereby congratulate the Dublin Jerome High School girls tennis team on its outstanding <clears throat> accomplishments for its 2019 season, signed this 18th day of November, 2019. Thank you. Coach, I see you have some parents out there taking a video. You know, this is live streamed, and they can go to the website and see the actual uh, video of this once it's posted. So. Uh, now we're on to the citizen comment portion of the agenda. I don't, we have a little sign-up sheet out there for people to sign up. Nobody signed up, but I will ask if anybody has anything they want to talk about for five minutes, you can come up and we'll listen to you. Seeing no hands, I will move on to, I did? Mm -hmm. Sir, come on up. If we could get your name and address. Uh, Randall Ayers, 5940 Roundstone Place. Double. Thank you for coming in. What's on your mind? Well, I was in the, the earlier uh, workshop, and I was kind of disappointed at how little APAP was able to respond to a lot of your questions. I would think you'd be frustrated, especially on the north side of Shire Rings, where the poles actually were going to be, where they're five feet off the, the, the pavement or 45 feet off the pavement. And, and what they can do, that makes a big difference as far as aesthetics. I think everybody in the Ballantre area is all interested about the aesthetics. And I thought they should have been more responsive to, to your questions and should have been better prepared. But uh, I know the city does have a chance with Ohio Siting Board, if they disagree, to go to the board and represent the city of Dublin and, and, and the residents uh, in trying to get better information before the Ohio Siting Board approves or disapproves something. So I would encourage you to do that. Thank you for Thank your you. comments, and I can tell you that uh, there are plenty of questions that we are still looking for answers for, put it that way. Tom, come on up. Tom Holton, 5957 Roundstone Place in Dublin. Uh, thank you. Uh, sure. Mayor and Council, I appreciate the uh, opportunity to have that work session. I thought that was very useful and heard a lot of information that I, I wish AEP had shared with us before particularly around that, the issue of transmission versus distribution lines. That was something we, we could have heard um, 
in, in the session, I think back in September, that would have been very useful information. We could have asked more questions, smarter questions earlier, particularly around um, the, the burial of the, the underground installation versus overhead and uh, would have known a lot more earlier than we did tonight. Um, the, uh, and seeing the difference between the poles, the 50-foot pole that we have today, because uh, as I think most of you know, I live in Ballantrae, and the, versus the 90-foot poles, that's a huge difference. And I, even though, the, as, as Mr. Keenan said, they're, they're a much simpler and cleaner line, definitely. There's no doubt about that compared to the poles now. But as you know, when, when, you, when you are used to a pole, the, the ones we have now, they're almost invisible uh, you, when you become used to them. Uh, we know that the underground installation was approved uh, by council about 17 years ago. In fact, about 17 years ago today, uh, the minutes that were provided by Mr. McDaniel today for me to study, uh, the council did approve the underground installation along Emerald Parkway or in that vicinity between the Davidson uh, Distribution, uh, distribution uh, Center, I'll call it, and um, the one on, Shire, on Emerald Parkway. And that the city paid the difference between the, the cost of the underground installation and aerial, um, if I understood it correctly. And the, the reason given uh, by Mr. McDaniel in the, in the minutes was the goal, as I understood it correctly, the goal was to clean up the line clutter in the city in keeping with aesthetic standards. Uh, so I think many of us in, in Ballantrae, the, the, those of us who've been discussing this, feel that the one argument we have is the aesthetic standards, that the uh, um, aesthetic standards, of, of, that the 90-foot poles don't really, are not in keeping with aesthetic standards uh, that the city has in, in the rest of the, of the uh, community. Um, we take a look over at the perimeter in the vicinity of Dublin Methodist Hospital, Kroger Shopping Center. There are no overhead lines there at all. And, uh, and Mr. McDaniel explains that there's reasons for that. They're, they're, they're not a, an apples-to-apples -apples comparison between what is or the installation of ins distribution versus transmission lines there versus Shire Rings. I understand. Well, I acknowledge that. I don't understand it as, as well as all of you will. But Still, that's, the aesthetics are, are kept um, over in that part of the community, and we'd like to see something similar over on our side of the community. Um, I'm in favor of option four, which is a partial burial uh, underground installation between uh, around the, the service center vicinity, uh, or just past the service center, down to uh, approximately Cosgrave Road. And I hope the Senate Council will consider that. Thank you. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate you coming in. Uh, ordinance is a second reading public hearing ordinance 62-19. Ann. Authorizing the city manager to execute necessary conveyance documents and to accept conveyance of a 0.072 acre fee simple warranty deed for right of way without limitation of existing access rights from CBJ on High LLC from the property located at 158 South High Street. Uh, members of council, I have no new information to report on this item beyond that which was reported at the first reading. Uh, staff does recommend adoption this evening. Be glad to answer any questions. Any you questions have. from council? Hearing none. Ann? Ms. Aludo? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Thank you. Thanks, Walt. 63-19. Amending Chapter 35 of the Codified Ordinances to revise the fee and service charge revenue cost comparison system and establish a next schedule of fees and service charges for City of Dublin services. Matt. Good evening, members of Council. Ordinance 63-19 was amended at the first hearing on November 4th. The motion to amend specified that the fees associated uh, with commercial PACE projects would remain $1,000. Appendix A of Ordinance 63-19 has been amended to reflect that motion. There are no additional changes since the first hearing. Questions from Council? Okay. No, no, thank you for doing that. Um, I think one of the things that we requested last time is that you'd keep us updated sort of the end of year, see, see how we're doing against, because we recognize that the cost does exceed this. Um, so if we could do that as we continue to do these, which is a wonderful thing, that'd be great. Absolutely. The, the service will be included in the cost study moving forward and studied as part of that process. Any other questions? Ann? 
Mr. Reiner? Yes. Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Aludo? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. 64-19. Adopting the annual operating budget for the fiscal year ending December 31st, 2020. Matt. Good evening again, members of council. There was some discussion at the first hearing on this ordinance regarding uh, one-time or non-recurring revenue and expenditures in 2020, as well as a request to examine our spending trend and what that may mean moving forward. So this presentation will address those three ideas. First, we'll address the non-recurring revenues and expenditures in the 2020 budget. The first item of note is that the city does not typically have non-recurring revenues. The only real example of this would be the sale of city property, particularly land. Uh, additionally, revenue collected from land purchases is typically returned to the fund that provided for the purchase of the land, and this has historically not been the general fund. Therefore, the city having any non-recurring revenue is a rare event, but it is planned to occur in 2020. In 2020, the city has a number of non-recurring expenditures, particularly expenditures associated with the 27th pay period and the final payment on the Regal property purchase. In addition, there are contractual obligations beginning in 2020 associated with park maintenance, economic development, and the city manager's office that are not planned to be recurring in nature. As the slide demonstrates, those revenues and expenditures are well matched in 2020. Additionally, contractual services planned in the 2020 operating budget total $18.6 million. A majority of this spending uh, in this category in many departments is utilized to provide what could be considered uh, required basic services, such as legal review, investment and banking services, commercial and residential plan review, et cetera. But in several departments, such as engineering or planning, Contractual services are more closely aligned with project execution planned for that particular year than daily operations. If it were to become necessary to quickly reduce expenditures, many of these project-specific contracts could be delayed or eliminated without significantly impacting services provided to our residents, at least in the short term. These expenditures are not necessarily non-recurring as these departments are planning new projects every year. Uh, but to the extent that these contracts can be delayed or eliminated if needed without impacting the delivery of basic services, it does represent a potential cushion between any potential revenue decline and expenditure reductions that would impact service delivery to our residents. The top green line on this graph shows revenue from 2016 through 2018. All revenue during this time frame was recurring, so the green line represents both amounts in this graph. Total actual expenditures are represented by the dark red line, and the total recurring expenditures are represented by the bottom light red line. Recurring expenditures increased 2.2% in 2017 and 1.2% in 2018. The difference between these total expenditures in 16 and 18 was the purchase of capital assets, and in 2017, there was an unusual tax refund of $2 million. Typically, actual expenditures for all tax refunds across the full year total $3.1 million. So that was an unusual event, to say the least. These slides demonstrate that we're not using non-recurring revenue to provide for recurring expenditures. Um, and as shown on the previous slide, non-recurring revenue and expenditures in 2020 are well matched. Historically, our expenditures have exhibited a stronger tendency to be non-recurring in nature than our revenues. Matt, may I ask you one question? Sure. For the recurring expenditures, does debt service fall under that on this slide? Debt service would be part of the capital improvement okay. program and isn't included in the operating budget per se as a revenue or as an expenditure. I didn't know if this was purely being, a, if these were all reoccurring expenditures or only relevant. This analysis is only going to focus on the general fund okay. and then those 200 special revenue funds that make up a majority of the operating budget. Anything that's from a TIF fund, the capital fund, the debt service fund are not included in an operating budget. Hey, Matt, would, would not the um, uh, dollars required to be added to the debt service fund come from the, the general fund if it were for non-TIF related things? I mean, They would first flow through probably the 401, the capital improvements tax fund, after the TIF funds the capital improvements. And if there were, for some reason, there would be no revenue there, then you would have to ultimately, as all funds are, backstopped by the general fund. Um, that would be uh, unlikely. Thank you. Sure. sure. Beyond, beyond uh, recurring and non-recurring revenue and expenditure discussion, an example of an examination of spending trends was requested. 
So this slide represents our operating revenue with the black line at the top, and our operating expenditures are represented by the stacked bar graph. Um, the top of the stacked bar graph represents uh, the total operating expenditures. Uh, this data is from actual expenditures for 2016 through 2018. Uh, by examining the data in this fashion, we can kind of cut through some of the noise and get to a trend analysis that I think we were looking for, but still remain at a relatively high level. So the information on this slide places expenditures related to other charges and expenses and capital expenditures um, in gray and removes them from our analysis. Uh, these tend to be the, the non-recurring type charges and aren't really representative of our daily operational costs, the way the other three categories are. The categories that remain include personal services, contractual services, and supplies, and these are the categories that most closely align with our expenditures to provide city services and daily operations. The orange line shows the trend in expenditures related to these expenditure categories. By focusing on just these categories, we see the emergence of a trend in expenditures. This trend shows an increase in 2017 of 4% and 4.1% in 2018. And this expenditure trend is narrowing the difference between operating revenues and expenditures over this time frame. So I think it's important to discuss uh, three points when examining this trend. First is that we have to acknowledge that expenditures most closely aligned with our services and daily operations have been increasing at a rate greater than our operating revenues. Obviously, if this situation were to occur indefinitely, we would eventually have a threat to our uh, ability to maintain a balanced budget. Despite this imbalance in expenditure growth as it compares to revenue growth, operating revenues have continued to exceed operating expenditures in each of these years and are expected to continue to do so. Operating revenues and operating expenditures and any trends within them are and will continue to be monitored as we bring forward proposed operating budgets this year and in the future. Second, the narrowing of the positive variance between operating revenues and expenditures is mainly due to the flat revenue line. There are strong indicators pointing to having a cautious level of optimism for the future regarding our operating revenues. As noted in the October financial report, year-to-date income tax revenue for 2019 is up 6.2% compared to 2018. If you take out some of the net profit earnings, we're still up 2.7% year-to-date compared to 2018. As you will recall for 2020 at our second council work session, operating revenues were discussed in significant detail regarding the projected 7% increase in 2020 operating revenues as compared to 2019. So we do believe and we are projecting some operating revenue increases um, and we're seeing some of that this year and projecting it for next. Uh, finally, economic development agreements approved by council in 2019 have identified over 2,100 new jobs that will be created in 2020 or 21. These new jobs and the increase in income tax revenues in 19 and the projected increase in 2020 operating revenues call into question a continued trend line of flat revenue. Finally, council and the administration have taken proactive action to ensure that expenditure growth related to daily operations remains as flat as possible while maintaining the city's current service levels. As council is aware, the one, one of the primary drivers in this increase is salary and benefit increases, and particularly the addition of new staff. Regarding salary increases during this time frame and proposed in 2020, current staff have generally been receiving around 2%. The growth is therefore being driven by benefit increases and the addition of new staff. In both of these areas, council and the administration are taking action. Council and staff have already identified that a discussion on health care benefits will occur in 2020 and potential plan changes will be evalu evaluated. With regard to new staff, as council will recall in the initial budget discussion, several positions not included in the proposed budget were put forward for discussion, including a senior engineer to natural history interpreter and a data analytics specialist. Ultimately, it was determined not to move forward with these positions at this time. Of the 10 new full-time positions contained in the proposed 2020 operating budget, only one does not contain a full or significant offset in costs associated with funding the position. By carefully limiting the growth of new staff positions, we continue to limit the growth of current and future budget expenditures and refrain from incre increasing that trend line any more than is minimally necessary. And finally, we'll take a look at how this trend might impact future years. I think it's important before we begin examining this analysis to make a few points. And the first is that the analysis is extremely sensitive. 
Uh, what I mean is that very reasonable small changes in revenue or expenditure um, levels compounded over three years can make a large difference in the data selected. Uh, that being said, the projected expenditures presented are based on the historical spend of the original budget as compared to actual expenditures, and projected revenues are based on year-to-date actual income tax revenues for 2019 um, and a 2% growth on the recurring income tax estimate for 2019, so separating out some of those net profit gains that we saw in October, uh, using that as the base for 2020 and 2021. The result of these decisions is likely a conservative projection on expenditures and revenues, um, and it likely represents a conservative scenario for 2020 and 2021, absent a third-party event acting upon the model. So this graph displays uh, the budgeted and projected revenue for 2019 uh, through 2021. The green lines represent revenue, while the red lines represent expenditures. The dark lines represent projections, while the lighter lines represent budgeted numbers. As you can see, our budgeted expenditures continue to exceed our budgeted revenue through 2021, while our projected revenues remain four to six million dollars ahead of our projected expenditures during this time frame. Breaking this out a little bit similar to how we examined the trend analysis in the previous uh, slide, this graph combines all, those, all that information previously provided and projects revenues and expenditures through 2021. The black line at the top of the graph represents the same revenue line as displayed on the previous graph. The top of the stack bar chart represents the same figure as the projected expenditure line on the previous chart. As before, capital charges and other expenditures are grayed out and removed from the analysis to examine the underlying trend in expenditures most closely aligned with city operations. As before, from 2016 to 2018, personal services, contractual services, and supplies increased just over 4%. In 2019, I'm projecting an increase of 4.2%, consistent with the previously identified trend. In 2020, due to the non-recurring personal services expenditures associated with the 27th pay and the 630,000 in non-recurring contractual services previously identified, that trend line grows to 7.3%. However, once these non-recurring charges are removed for 2021, and the projected increases in these three categories are added. So assuming that we get salary increases in 2021, assuming there's a normal level of benefit increases in 2021, et cetera, for these categories, we see a projected increase of 1.4%. Uh, together, these two, two amounts uh, kind of trend back to that 4% over, two, over the final two years. These percentages can be a bit misleading. Um, so this final graph displays the same information, but instead of displaying the percentage, it shows the dollar value of the change in operating revenues and expenditures on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, this graph and the previous demonstrate that the trend of 4% growth in personal services, contractual services, and supplies needs to be continuously monitored. Uh, the difference between operating revenues and expenditures uh, does continue to narrow, but the variance between operating revenues and all operating expenditures continues to be projected positive four to six million dollars. Um, in closing, I think it's important to acknowledge and monitor the trend in expenditures as compared to revenues while continuing to take proactive steps to minimize expenditures and increase revenues, making it likely this trend will not continue. The 2020 operating budget as contained in Ordinance 64-19 maintains our progress towards priorities identified by Council while also maintaining the high level of city services our residents expect. It also continues our practice of having a balanced budget where actual operating revenues exceed actual operating expenders, expenditures. And as this analysis demonstrates that despite the previously discussed expenditure trends, this situation is not expected to change as operating revenues are projected to continue to exceed operating uh, expenditures under conservative assumptions through 2021. And I'm available for any questions. Questions from Council. I just want to say that uh, I think it's prudent that we are adding the new staff, and I, th I think that was a good idea, really. Thank you. Kat? Uh, thank you. Um, Matt, thanks very much. I know this took a fair bit of work, and um, Matt and I have had a couple conversations over the, the, the past couple of days, and I really appreciate it. If you want to go back up that, the last slide you had before this, or the present, yeah, that's a good one. I, I, I think this is quite a helpful slide, and I, I I so appreciate your work 
and, and hopefully our, our continued production of this, because it does help us, I think, at a very high level. We're not getting down in the weeds and looking at specific expenditures. But when we see trend lines going like this, it does help us recognize that the cost of running the city as we grow, as um, needs for park maintenance, as needs for benefits, et cetera, are going to continue to, to grow at at least a 4% 4, 4 clip. And I, I think, as you say, as those lines come together, it's going to be important for us to watch that. Secondly, I, I think it also helps us really look at some of those non-recurring things and ask ourselves, are they in fact going to be recurring and one of the examples that I note is um, earlier on the the increase in park contractual services this year as we add more parks as we have aging parks etc for so forth some of those things I think help us get indicators as to uh, when we look at those lines uh, are we seeing some permanent shifts there and what that might mean so for me I, I found this helpful to really actually look at the, the trend lines. I don't want to say that matter most, but help us think about what it, it takes to run. So I appreciate that. Um, I, I am comfortable when I see this that there's certainly, uh, from a 2020 perspective, uh, financially st still solid, still good, n no issues, um, but appreciate and hope going forward that we really continue to mon monitor this and as things grow because, as you said, eventually those lines um, um, cross if, if things don't change. But so appreciate this, and I do think this will will be very helpful for us as we move forward. So I, thank you for that, Matt. I appreciate sure. it. Matt, I have just one question about the 1.5% reduction in 2021. Is that just a conservative estimate, or is there something forecasted specific that led it, you to that? It's, it's two things. One, it's conservative. It's two years of conservatism, so it is a bit compounded. But the real difference is once you take that $3.2 million in non-recurring revenue in 2020, we don't sell land in 2021, so it takes our operating revenues down 3.2 million just to start the comparison. And then you, you do make some of that up, but obviously not all of it. Very good, thank you. Anything else, Jane? No, um, I, I actually like the, uh, the, the charts showing actuals versus budget. It can give you an idea of whether or not um, we're, we're sticking pretty close to the line. Uh, one of the things that I noticed was in the line items of 71, 3004, which was the other professional services, and 71, 3005, which are contractual services. Those were our largest increases over the last three years, if you watch those over a three-year trend. Obviously, we're adding amenities. We're growing as a city, but um, they, they become, um, they become a... Um, a line item that obviously is growing faster in percentage wise because I think our staff has done a great job as you look through all the other line items in their departments. They've held them pretty close other than personnel services, but those contractual services are an indicator of the kinds of needs that we're growing in. And I think it would be an interesting uh, study to kind of look to see over the period what those contractual services are so we can see what our needs have been shifting to over that period of time. So I think that would be an interesting exercise, certainly not for now, but it's just one of those flags that come up and say um, that that one's grown pretty quickly. Sure. One of the challenges with this kind of short time horizon, only having three years, it's hard to predict a trend. But one of the things we have seen over the last three years is a shift in IT from capital infrastructure purchases to more of a contractual type relationship. And that's part of the reason for some of that increase is we're not buying servers, we're buying hosted services. So it's moving capital, uh, capital infrastructure purchases to the operating budget. And, and we're going to continue to see that moving forward. It's likely to accelerate more than it is slow down. Um, so we'll, we'll continue to look at that and continue to share that information with you. Yeah, I, th I think understanding the categories of where those contractual services lies helps us to understand, one, if we're meeting the priorities that we've set for ourselves, like in uh, certain areas that we've, we've designated we want to spend those extra dollars. And if that occurs in contractual services, kind of gives us a reassurance that that's where the money's being used. Okay. Thank you. Great. Anything else? Michael, anything? Christina? Yeah, it is extremely difficult, Matt, to get things to look simple. Uh, and I really appreciate your persistence with these diagrams and things, because it really does encapsulate, I think, what Kathy's been getting at for. Uh, all these conversations. So thank you very much for your stick to -itiveness 
on that. Hearing no other questions, Anne? Uh, Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Uh, Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Ms. Aluto? Yes. Uh, thanks, Matt. Ordinance 65 19. Amending various sections of Ordinance 15 17. Homer. Uh, yeah, uh, good evening, uh, Council. Uh, there are no changes since the first uh, reading on November 4th. I'm prepared to answer any questions you may have. Any and questions? We recommend from approval. Hearing none, Ann? Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Uh, Ms. Aluto? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. Ordinance 66 19. Authorizing provision of certain incentives to Renaissance Tech LLC to induce it to purchase a facility to retain and expand its corporate headquarters and its associated operations and workforce all within the city, authorizing execution of an economic development agreement. Sarah, welcome. Good evening. Um, there's no new additional information since the first reading. I do have members um, Jeremy Finley and Benjamin Karam from Renaissance Tech with us tonight that would like to come up and share their story. Welcome, gentlemen. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for having us. Address for you. Thank you. Uh, address 5880 Venture Drive. Uh, my name is Ben Karam. This is my business partner, Jeremy Finley. Uh, we are the founders of Renaissance Tech. Renaissance Tech is an enterprise software company. Um, we have clients all over the U.S., Canada, uh, just now in the U.K. Um, one of our local customers in, in Dublin is, is Sutton Fire Truck. Um, we've um, built up a really amazing, talented, diverse uh, team, um, and uh, actually, and most of which work uh, in our Dublin office um, on Venture Drive. Um, if, if you check out the Chambers video on the Dublin Battle of the Businesses this last year, you'll see clips of our team participating in that. Um, more importantly, you'll see some highlights of us getting second place in the kickball tournament. <laughs> we'll, we'll be back next year. Um, we, first place. We, we started this business six and a half years ago in each other's spare bedrooms. Um, at the time, I was living in Galleon, Ohio, with my family and Jeremy and Lewis Center. Um, early on, we realized we needed some, some space in which to hire people and grow, and we came across the Dublin Entrepreneurial Center, um, which for us had a, had a great blend of of, of features, modern office, kind of a feel to it. It was very affordable, very economical for us to start there. We started with a, a desk and then an office and then two offices. Uh, and also had an entrepreneurial like spirit and community there. And it was, it was good to work with a lot of other small businesses and just um, uh, kind of engage with, with, with their energy as well. Um, it also gave us uh, some familiarity in working there over a couple of years with just the city of Dublin in general. And so as, as we grew and graduated out of uh, the deck, um, we took the opportunity to lease uh, an office in historic Dublin, uh, which was a beautiful and charming experience for all of us. We spent uh, 18 months, about 18, a year and a half uh, downtown just enjoying that, that experience. Um, we continued to grow and we purchased our current building on uh, Perimeter and Venture. Uh, we renovated that and um, have pretty much filled that space to capacity. Um, and now we're, we're looking to continue to, uh, to grow and, and uh, to grow within, uh, grow within Dublin. Really the last um, six years have been pretty transformative for both of us. Um, we've moved our families and our lives to Dublin and, and now are looking to continue to, to grow our, our business here. I um, want to thank really everyone that we kind of met and worked with along the way. The City of Dublin, the Econ Dev Office, uh, Historic Dublin, the Chamber. Um, just everyone's been very responsive, like proactive. Um, again, there's, there's kind of a positive can-do energy uh, that exists within this city that, that's good for us. Um, I think initially, uh, when we were when we came to Dublin, it was more look for just a good place to get started. Uh, we weren't really uh, analyzing it at, at, at any you know, more depth than that. We got, got started at the DAC, um, but we've gotten to, to know what Dublin really has to offer. And as, as we look to grow, we're looking at infrastructure and talent and people and energy uh, and these things. So um, anyway. Oh, that's fantastic. You. you guys are like a poster child for the, I mean, yeah. everything that's good about the deck and guys like you that are just 
taking an idea and making a career out of it. And now, am I to understand both of you live in Dublin as well? Yeah. That the ball is out of the park. You have now hit the cover <laughs> off the ball. So, um, that's well, absolutely fantastic. What do you, you go to work in the morning, and what do you do exactly? <laughs> that's what I was going to ask. You. I, what, <laughs> I, I read the synopsis, but I wanted to. So, so, in 30 seconds or less, what do you do when you get to work? Uh, well, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a myriad of pretty much everything now that we're growing. Uh, we're wearing a lot of hats. We work with product configuration systems, those software applications where you configure product the way you want to buy it. Uh, we work with a lot of window and door companies. Again, Southern Fire Truck is a good example of a complex product that um, the software we work with tries to make simple to order. Wow. Fantastic. Uh, I'll, I'll sum it up for you. Sure. My wife is always like, hey, what do you do for a living? She tells them computer stuff. So that's all you need to know. We okay. <laughs> <laughs> that's all we need to know. So Any... I'll, I'll ask a question. Yeah. So I saw for, when I went out looked that in for the product that you, uh, so was this the Sightline product or the beginning of that? Because I spent some time at, at Cymex years ago. So I'm wondering, is that the genesis yeah, that of that? Yeah. yeah, so I, I know what they do. <laughs> that's fantastic you know uh, at, at the time that when the organization decided to go into the configuration end of that business that was the really scary stuff but it turned out that it was probably some of the most valuable stuff right the configuration of this is AI changing all of that or it maybe could. It's, maybe yeah. Yeah, they're starting, they're starting to play around with some of that I mean all the new technology from AI to 3D to 2D basic online ordering I mean, is game-changing for a lot of these companies, too. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. That's wonderful. And it's great to see the continued um, evolution of some of that work. So that's wonderful. Congratulations. That's great. And when it comes to the relationship with the city, I tell these new companies all the time, it's not a date. It's a marriage. We'll be here throughout uh, your continued expansion. So don't forget. I mean, you're part of who we are, and you're sort of the best part. That's what, exactly what we're looking for. So sort of like a little of the Elon Musk story. I mean, I'm yeah, really Elon impressed Musk. these two guys. <laughs> God, go. So way to go. Thank you for coming in. Appreciate it very much. Thank you. Ann? Uh, Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Saludo? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor Ambrose Grooms? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. First reading uh, ordinance is Ordinance 67-19. Authorizing the city manager to enter into a real estate transfer and development agreement and an infrastructure agreement for the development of the corners development in the city and for the construction of certain related infrastructure and park improvements, authorizing execution of various related agreements and documents. I will introduce it. Donna. Good evening, members of council. At your last meeting, we introduced a project that we call the Corners, which is located along France Road between Rings Road and Blazer Parkway. And we introduced four pieces of legislation for your consideration to move this project forward. So based upon the feedback that we received this evening, we will be presenting the Real Estate Transfer and Development Agreement and the Infrastructure Agreement, which outlines the basic business terms of the agreement. So should council decide to move forward with a second reading of this ordinance, we will proceed with the council agenda as written tonight and bring forward the three additional ordinances for the TIF modification and creation as well as the rezoning request. Pending council's favorable review, staff proposes to bring all four ordinances forward for second reading as well as a resolution to accept the preliminary plat on December 2nd. If, however, we do not receive favorable response from council on the terms of the agreement tonight, we will not be presenting the three other items that are associated with the project at this time. With that, I'd like to remind you what the project site looks like. You'll recall that sub area A, which is in yellow, is the public, pri public park area. And that is approximately four acres with pedestrian bicycle connections to and through the site. Sub area B1, which is in pink, is the commercial development area, and that's approximately six and a half acres, and that will include approximately 47,000 square feet of restaurant and retail space. Sub areas B2 and B3 are shown in green and purple, and each of those sites is approximately one and a half acres, and those will be built to suit office pad sites and can hold approximately 12,000 square feet each. The total private improvements are estimated at $15.4 million, and the total project cost to the city for the park and the required public improvements, including the developer financing structure, is 3,895,000. 
So tonight, we are seeking your authorization to move forward with the business terms as described and articulated in the two separate agreements in your packet. The first one is the real estate transfer and development agreement, and the second would be the infrastructure agreement. In regard to the real estate transfer and development agreement, as, and as outlined in your memo and supporting documents, the Daimler Group, in exchange for the transfer of sub areas B1, B2, and B3, agrees to design, construct, finance a portion of, and install public improvements, as well as maintain the public gateway at the corner of the site. It's important to note that ownership of the land will not be transferred until Council's approval of the final development plan, the property transfer and development agreement, and the infrastructure agreement. So once Daimler holds ownership of the property, should they desire to transfer any piece or portion of B1, B2, or B3 to an entity other than an affiliated holding group or LLC of the Daimler group prior to 20 years from the date of transfer from the city, they will be required to reimburse the city for costs incurred for the land and associated legal expenses on a per acre basis. And that's been calculated at $84,406 per acre. Additionally, prior to the city's transfer of ownership, Daimler must obtain approval of an amended final development plan and obtain a lot split for a project on that site, which would be subject to approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Further, should subarea B1 remain undeveloped for a period of three years, or should subareas B2 and B3 remain undeveloped for a period of five years from the date of transfer, the city shall have the option to purchase back each of the subareas for a cost of $100 plus the documented out-of-pocket po po out costs that were specifically incurred for that subarea. If there are no questions on this portion of the real estate transfer and development agreement, I can move forward with the infrastructure agreement. Any questions at this point? Okay. Uh, is there expectations on um, the remains of the undeveloped period? As, have we set any parameters? Is, is it structural? Is it cost of structure? Is it? I'm not certain I understand your question, Council it's, Member. Uh, uh, should subarea B1 remain undeveloped for a period of three years from the date of transfer, the city will have the option to purchase the property. But what is the development standards, I guess? So what does developed really mean? What yeah, does it right. mean to be substantially developed? So for area B1, what we're looking for is that the area of square footage that I mentioned, 47,000 47, square feet, is what we anticipate to be built out in B1. So if we see that kind of development there and that momentum occurring, we will feel that they have satisfied their terms under the agreement. B2 and B3, which are the office pads, again, they have a little bit longer to move forward with those. Um, but there is some infrastructure that obviously they will want to put into the site. It, it would behoove them from an economic standpoint to do that simultaneously. So as they market those pads, those office pads, certainly there would be some cost incurred there. So if we see that development, that tra trajectory, some interest that's happening in the property, we would feel that they have satisfied their, their agreement. Okay. Thank you. Certainly. Any okay. other questions on these provisions? Just on, on the one about the, um, the agreement part about the, the parks, it, um, in the development or in the agreement, in the infrastructure agreement, it talks about the city's um, obligation to finish out the park, and it, it describes different elements of it. I am assuming that that's, um, that's a preliminary um, sort of uh, agreement that we have about what will go into the parks, or is how permanent is that sort of a... Yeah, so that we, yeah, that's based on an estimate that we have put together working with the civil engineers and the uh, engineers that are working with the developer. So we've come up with that kind of budgeted number, which we've built into the TIF uh, arrangement and financial structure. And Matt can talk a little bit more about that. But in terms of the details of the development for the park, what all of those actual, you know, nitty gritty things are, those have not been determined yet. So we've just got that ballpark number to work with. Okay, thank you. Sure. Any other questions on this part? I guess not. All right, so with that, I'll move forward to the infrastructure agreement. And this document addresses the terms by which the developer will proceed in complete construction of the public improvements. It also outlines the financing structure of the developer's portion of those public improvements. 
So the first item for council's consideration is detailed in section five of the, the agreement. And that is to agree that the developer will serve as the general contractor for those public improvements with the expectation that they will be completed in a manner that is consistent and applicable with city requirements and development regulations. And those should be completed no later than December 31st, 2021. If, however, the developer does not meet that deadline, they will be given a 30-day notice to cure any default. And alternatively, the city and or the developer may also pursue options that are outlined in section 7.1 of the agreement to remedy that non-performance or compliance. The second consideration for council necessary to execute the project is the establishment of a project fund. As outlined in section six of the agreement, the city would cash fund the first $1.6 million of cost and Daimler would provide upfront funding for the balance of $1.765 million. The developer has conceptually agreed to carry the remaining costs up to $2 million with annual reimbursement payments of approximately $230,000 to be made by the city over a 10 year period through the TIF agreement. The expectation is that Daimler will begin to build out the site with sub area B1 along France Road to include that supporting infrastructure in year 2020 with approximately $3 million of property improvements in 2021, 4 million in year 2022, and 3.4 million in 2023 to total the $10.4 million minimum project value. Thus, the city would be receiving property taxes on the full valuation of the improvements beginning in 2024. So we've taken a conservative approach when calculating the TIF as the build out of the office pads has not been figured into that financial scenario. As I mentioned initially, the, the project cost is expected to be $15.4 million. We've taken that $5 million out and based our TIF structure on that $10.4 million valuation only. So the, um, that pro all of those calculations will not have any impact on the 2024 CIP as this project doesn't utilize any of the income tax revenue and the project is fully funded through the TIF dollars that are not currently programmed for any other specific purpose in the CIP. So if council agrees to the key conditions as described in the infrastructure agreement, we will proceed with the legislation this evening to address the modification to and the creation of the, the TIF to support the project's development. So pending council's approval of this ordinance, staff will continue with the agenda as published and present the following related legislation that includes an ordinance to modify the existing TIF an ordinance to create the new Rings France TIF and an ordinance, ordinance to rezone the parcel. So pending council's approval of all four of those ordinances, staff proposes to bring them forward for second reading as well as a resolution to accept the preliminary plat at the December 2nd council meeting. And with that, I welcome council's questions on the business terms of the agreement. Any questions on the I had a couple. Thank you. Um, so the $1.6 million for the the um, investment, the first phase of the park, or, or, um, is that intended to be cash funded, uh, general fund funded, or yeah, let me, Matt saying no? Okay. I'll turn that one over to Matt and he'll Thank you. get specific. Sure. That $1.6 million mm -hmm. is from the fund balance of the Rings France ah, TIF. Okay, great. Um, and then the second question is the timing of uh, the city's... Um, uh, work on that park or the or again it would be the developers because that's the way it works. What would be the timing of the park versus the timing of the rest of the development? Oh, all of that is expected to occur concur concurrently. So, so the work on the park would not begin unless and until? Until there was a development on the sub area B1 which, which fronts the France Road piece. So back to the earlier questions about timing, the park would begin when we begin to see some other development exactly. happen on there, but not before that. No, and two, as I mentioned, there's a timeline that's tied to the development of area, sub area B1, which is 2021. So we would expect to see that work start to, to happen immediately. Thank you. Anything else, Jane? I had a couple questions about uh, it. The memo addresses prevailing wage for uh, the construction of the park. Mm -hmm. um, is there any interest, you know, oftentimes, uh, private entities will construct park 
areas and dedicate it back to the city. Um, being that this is a fee, do we have any options with that? Because that's surely going to drive up the costs of that parkland development. No, we've not. No, we've not built that into the agreement. Prevailing wages is stipulated as part of the, the terms of the agreement. I can turn that over to it, legal since as it's well. construction of a park. It would we would have to follow prevailing wage no matter what. Right. Even if they were to retain any portion yes. of ownership. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I think one thing for the a public to understand is that by creating this new TIF, this is a non-school TIF, so this, the schools are fully uh, made whole mm -hmm. by that. So I think that's an important um, uh, point to make here. And then um, on the, and I believe it's in the the changing it to a PUD. And I don't know if you have you gotten quite to that. Are we? Is that the next thing you're That's talking about? Yeah, that that will be presented um, as part of the rezoning. Um, okay, so I just have a question about that, um, past that. So um, that's all. I just want to be, make that point. Okay, so nobody has any problems, although we're going to have a second hearing. Nobody has any problems at this point with this agreement in this ordinance. Okay, then we will go on to Ordinance 68-19. Amending ordinance number 8300, Rings, France. TIF passed June 19, 2000, as subsequently amended to supplement the public improvements to be made to benefit the property and identified in that ordinance. I will introduce it. Matt. Good evening, uh, Council. Ordinance 68-19 modifies the existing Rings, France TIF in order to fund the public improvements outlined in the development agreement with the Daimler Group. Uh, the TIF was established in or by Ordinance 83-00 in 2000 and has not been previously modified. The modifications in Ordinance 68-19 would allow for the public improvements outlined in the development agreement um, and funded from a transfer from this TIF. These modifications include those uh, listed on the slide there. Uh, the total for this TIF uh, will transfer just over $3 million over the next eight years to the new TIF in order to pay for the public improvements outlined in the development agreement. This will include the $1.6 million transfer in year one and then an additional $1.45 million in total over the next seven years. The funding provided by this TIF is outlined in the fifth column on this slide and the chart dealing, uh, detailing the project's cost and funding stream um, is provided by this slide. As noted, total transfers from this TIF will be just over $3 million. And this slide provides some additional information on the cost regarding the public improvements associated with the development agreement that will be undertaken as part of the TIF modification. Staff is recommending approval at the second hearing on December 2nd. Any questions from council? Matt, can you back up to your second slide? Um, so, So some of the improvements we intend to do on this parcel were not permitted by the original TIF. Correct. So we are adding those capabilities to the original TIF. Uh, in the, the next ordinance that we hear, we'll be developing a new TIF on this property. So is part of the modification of this TIF then removing that parcel. Can a property be under two different TIFs simultaneously? No, a property can't be. The, the next ordinance that creates the new TIF will actually remove the project area from the parcel on a parcel by parcel basis as there are public improvements on that parcel. Okay. Similar to how we did H2 Hotel and Cooker, very identical kind of fashion. The reason that we have to modify this TIF at all is because of its age. In 2000, when we drafted the public improvements for TIF, we were extremely prescriptive and rigid. If this TIF would have been 2010 or later, we probably wouldn't need to modify it. But for example, the current TIF language doesn't contemplate a public park at all. That's a significant component of this development agreement, so we need to include that language in this new uh, modified TIF. So the next ordinance that removes this from this TIF and creates it in a new one, <clears throat> we are precluded from spending these monies in a new TIF property. No, no. The, 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 this one's a little awkward because the parcel is actually in both TIFs. Right. It would work the same way if they were close, in close proximity to each other. It just happens to be, in this case, they are on the same project area. 
my question really was related to if we remove it, if we approve these expenditures uh, in this TIF and then we remove it, can we spend the money that we just allocated in something that has been removed? Sure. We, we are allowed to transfer money between TIFs if a project has a public purpose for both TIFs. You'll see some of our um, construction projects that might run roadway projects that connects between two TIFs would be probably a better example than, than a more common example, not necessarily better, more common for how multiple TIFs can fund the same project. Very good. Thank you. By, by, by making this modification, we're making it clear that we intend for this TIF to be allowed to pay for the park. If we just removed it and didn't modify it, you might say, well, that wasn't a purpose for the money initially until you moved it. This makes clear what our intention is. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? Jane? Just, um, Matt, on this particular TIF, on the, uh, the existing TIF, uh, once this money is moved out, will that have... Um, taken all the money out of that TIF or will that, that TIF has remaining dollars to be spent for amenities? Correct. That TIF has a fund balance of about $4.7 million. Mm -hmm. The remainder of the funds are currently programmed in the five-year CIP, so there won't be any additional funds, but the 1.6 that we're spending is not programmed in the current CIP, so there'll be no impact on it. All right. Thank you. Any other questions on this one? Okay, we'll see you back on December 2nd on that one. Ordinance 69-19. Declaring the improvement to certain parcels of rural property known as the Corners Development to be a public purpose and exempt from taxation, providing for the collection and deposit of service payments and specifying the purposes for which those service payments may be expended, specifying the public infrastructure improvements directly benefiting the parcels, authorizing compensation payments to the Dublin City School District and the Tolls Career and Technical Center, and repealing Ordinance Number 8300. I will introduce it, Matt. All right. Ordinance 69-19 creates a new TIF and repeals the existing Rings France TIF on the project site as development occurs and according to the development agreement with the Daimler Group. Uh, private improvements um, estimated in this TIF, as Donna mentioned, are $15.4 million. The funding model is based on a $10.4 million valuation. That's what supports the public improvements and that is what the minimum service payment is based upon. At that $10.4 million valuation, the TIF is expected to generate $3.5 million um, in revenues over its 30-year life. These TIF proceeds will be used to fund the public improvements previously discussed and identified as part of the development agreement. Any questions? Oh, you started. Sorry. The, go the, ahead. No, go ahead. <laughs> the funding provided by this TIF is outlined in the sixth column. Um, and the, as noted, it will utilize just under $850,000 in service payment revenue over its first 10 years. Over the final 20 years, the TIF will end with, uh, will generate approximately $130,000 a year and end with a fund balance of about $2.6 million. We recommend approval at the second hearing. Any questions from Council? Okay, moving right along to Ordinance 70-19. Rezoning approximately 13.5 acres more or less located at West of France Road, north of Rings Road and south of Bla Paul Blazer Parkway from OLR Office Laboratory and Research District to PUD Planned Unit Development District, the corners, for the future development of up to 70,000 square feet for commercial and office uses and a public park. I will introduce it. Claudia. Good evening, May Mayor and members of Council. So this before you is the rezoning ordinance where we are in our second uh, step as outlined in the zoning code to go from a standard district site, which is currently zoned OLR, to a planned unit development district with a preliminary development plan that you would be approving with this ordinance, as well as the development text, which accompanies and goes hand in hand with the plan. So you have the rules in the text and the visuals in the plan. Again, real quickly, we've talked about this at the last meeting and tonight. The site is just north of Rings and west of France. And it includes the um, stormwater management ponds that the city installed for um, Cardinal Health there. Like we discussed, it is currently zoned OLR, so um, it's a standard district that was created in the 70s or even before then and would not currently permit that mixed-use environment that um, is desired here for this site and across the um, DCAP area plan. Um, within the DCAP area plan, however, it does lay out 
uh, future land uses which would speak to those types of uses that are envisioned here and um, as we've been discussing over the last few months that the zoning code just hasn't um, caught up to those future land uses and therefore the PUD is the appropriate mechanism to get the zoning into place. So with that, it's a little bit more detail here for that um, preliminary development plan. And um, like Donna had mentioned already, there are um, proposed uses, mix of office, commercial, retail, and then the park there in the center. Uh, development is capped at approximately 70,000 square feet. And then included in the preliminary development plan are some architectural images that um, have been vetted through public meetings with the neighborhood as well as the um, Planning and Zoning Commission. And there was definitely that desire for having a more rural architectural feel, especially for the retail uh, pieces that are out on France um, to also coordinate somewhat and relate to the field of corn, which is south of Rings. And then some images um, referencing developments that Daimler has done in town of similar sizes and similar uses. And then also included um, reference images for what the park could look like in the future, what kind of amenities and improvements could take place there. And um, that gets a little bit to Ms. Fox's question about the details of the park. So those would be part of the final development plan, which the Planning and Zoning Commission would see and um, would obviously have a lot of staff input and uh, parks input, landscape architect, with parks as well being part of that review team. So with that, the Planning and Zoning Commission recommended approval to City Council on September the 19th with six conditions, um, five of which have been addressed as part of the package that is before you. The sixth one deals with parking. There was some um, conversation at Planning Commission regarding shared parking and how that would lay out and what types of different uses would have types of different needs. And since we don't know those yet, as to which building are they going to be in and which parking lots are they going to take. That information would be something that we can provide at the final development plan stage to the commission. So with that, we are also recommending approval of this ordinance at the um, December 2nd, uh, second reading. Thank you, Claudia. Any Thank questions you. from council? Jane? I do. Um, all of these things of planning and zoning um, were very beneficial, especially adding the commercial, um, the neighborhood commercial, because it allowed some uses that originally were in the development text that didn't provide for that. But there's one item in the development text speaking to architecture in sub areas B2 and B3, and that says it's intended to provide the architecture in those areas intended to provide a transition between the rural agriculturally influenced architecture of sub area B1 an existing contemporary architecture of office developments to the west, meaning that the architecture would be different in the front of the partial from the back of the partial. They're, they were asking for a transitional contemporary. And so what I would um, like to discuss is, I believe it's 10 acres. The partial needs cohesiveness and architectural style. So I would, I would like to see that, um, that change so that um, the sub areas B2 and 3 would have similar architectural style and not change from the front to the back of the partial. I just think, especially with the Central Park, it's going to look a little bit um, disconnected. Um, and I think it was just something that was recommended early on when we were talking about developing Metro Blazer in, in this sort of contemporary style. But there are no, really no adjacent contemporary buildings near this partial. So it wouldn't really be speaking to any other architecture to look at it other than the Cardinal Building, which is quite a ways distance. I think cohesively in an aesthetic, the entire partial should have similar architecture. So that's just. Um, Where did you find that? Where's that? Like? It's in the development text, and I I think if you if we pass this, then this is sort of the recommended. Now I am I suppose in planning and zoning. Um, one could go back and, and change this, but I'm not sure. Well, the, um, you're correct. There is absolutely that desire to provide some type of a 
transition from whatever that walkable, more rural farm look is that is envisioned for that France Road frontage mm -hmm. um, with that potentially not being what the um, developer was envisioning for um, the office parcel, mainly because it is more of a flatter, single-story kind of an architectural theme. Um, and obviously the um, seven-story building is very boxy and modern. So what the text does say, though, um, it has an intent in there about um, creating contemporary architecture for the developments to the west, but it also says that there is um, as otherwise approved as a planning and zoning commission. So in terms of materials, in terms of colors, all of those things are written out, but the planning commission would ultimately be the ones that would, hopefully with the user in mind as well. I could be, see how the, the farm architecture could be difficult for an office design, but maybe instead of putting contemporary, maybe we change that word to complementary architecture. I, I think that's so, what I'm looking at. When you say contemporary, um, I think because of the way that we had originally designed the, the Metro Blazer area, we were looking for more urban contemporary architecture. <laughs> I'm looking for complementary. I think that there and are I many think ways. Some contemporaries can be complementary, like I'm thinking of the rail that's just a little bit mm -hmm. further down. Right. Could be a complementary kind of architecture to what is exist what what is envisioned here in in those right. illustrations. So yeah. maybe if we just changed contemporary to complementary. And I just wanted to point out that the paragraph says the existing contemporary architecture. It doesn't say contemporary architecture is required for new buildings. Right, but I think what we want is the intent of the balance of this site to be complementary to the new. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Not yeah. necessarily in reference to the to the cardinal building. We would prefer to, comp instead of complement the cardinal building, we would prefer to complement the frontage of France Road. Gotcha. Right. So we can bring some um, yes. revised language back for that second reading. That'd be wonderful. I think that's, that's really the better, because I, I, I want to be sure that the intent there was not to create two different types of architecture on a small parcel around a central park. Because then you're going to have three in a row, because it's not going to look mm -hmm. like the cardinal building, and it's not going to look like the front. And then, right. so, yeah. yeah, we'll propose something for your second Great. reading. Thank you. Anything and else, Jane? Just one other comment uh, about um, an architecture, and I know that we'll we'll be addressing this at planning and zoning, but um, without going through, um, you know, a majority of this, the um, the document allows for quite a bit of flexibility when it comes to window fenestrations and that sort of thing. We're not um, we're not creating a form based code kind of um, uh, regiment about what they will be able to do. Creativity and flexibility are are built into this um, text, development text, I'm hoping. Yes, so there is no number crunching of percentages okay. like you're used to in the more form-based code. Okay, all right. That's what I was wondering. Thank you. Is that it? Any other questions from council? Nope. All right, we'll see you back on December 2nd on that one as well. Thank you, Claudia. Resolutions, whoops, uh, Ordinance 71-19. Establishing appropriations based on the 2020 operating budget of the City of Dublin, State of Ohio for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2020. I will introduce it. Matt. Ordinance 71-19 contains the appropriations for the operating budget uh, we just adopted earlier this evening, and we're requesting approval at the December 2nd hearing. Questions from Council? <clears throat> hearing none. Uh, we'll see you back on December 2nd. Ordinance 72-19. Amending the annual appropriations for the fiscal year ending December 31, 2019. I will introduce it. Matt? This ordinance contains um, amendments to the annual appropriations, and I'm available for questions. Any questions from council? Yeah. I had a couple. Um, I'll, I'll start with sort of the, the resulting chart that you had at the end of the memo, Matt, that you gave us that... Um, addresses the current fund balance as of, I guess, November the 4th. And then with the, this supplemental $15 million addition um, and, some, and the remaining encumbrances, et cetera, so forth, that puts the ending cash balance around $43.8 million. Is that, how does, close does that get us to what our required 
because this is an advance, it's accepted out of the debt service policy because we're going to backfill that $15 million with bond proceeds probably between February and April of next year. So that does, uh, that $43 million isn't the number that will be referenced when we reference our general fund balance. It'll be the 43 plus the 15. Um, so that, uh, of that appropriation, the 15, the fifteen million. What would we saying? Fourteen million of that is going to be. The fifteen five is going to be um, bond proceeds. From. Fourteen million for the park and one point five for the sewer will be repaid to the general fund for this advance when we sell the bonds in the first quarter of next year. So, what is the anticipated total value of that bond offering in twenty twenty? Do you have I, that number? I don't have that right now. That's a discussion I need to have. Um, starting next month, but it'll be at least 15.5 and 6 million for the pool. And then I'll have to have some conversations to see what other projects may have been budgeted for debt proceeds, particularly sewer projects in 19 that are going to be constructed in 2020. So it'll be in that area. The, the debt fund policy, or I'm sorry, the um, general fund balance policy, what number do you use for that? Is that our projected or actual numbers? Sure, it is the actual number from the previous year. No, sorry. It is the budgeted number from the current year plus all supplementals approved throughout the year for January through November. And then in December, it becomes the actual number. That's the number that's reported in all the budget slides. We use the actual as soon as we have it. So what is that number? I'd have to go back. It's been a while since I looked at 2019. Do we need the entire, I guess my question we do. is, we need the entire 15.5 to we do. meet our... It's not the first time that our debt has gone below the 50% threshold in order to advance fund uh, uh, bond debt service projects. This will be the second time we've done that. You mean our reserve? Go I'm on. sorry, our reserve, yeah. And the thinking behind excluding the debt funding is that it would be debt funding within a year's period of time or I mean is there a time window on that policy or there, I mean council could say we're not real interested in doing a debt issuance because of capital markets and yes, it's kind of a commitment to sale the sale of debt isn't it yeah that's what it is and that's why I was interested in that I'll have to read through the policy more. in a bit more detail on the particulars related to that but I'll get back with you yeah that might be interesting to to look at that time window there, only because we're now touching it or below. What, what is that, given our current operating, what would be that floor? That's the number he's going to check on, I think. For 2020, once we get to January, it'll become the budgeted expenditures, which were 90, no, budgeted operating expenditures. 97? 95, 9. 96? Yeah. So yeah, we we report back around. For, yeah, I'll that. I'll, uh, I'll look at that policy in more detail and write you a very detailed memo on what we what fund balance we use and when we switch. Because I, I think those are going to be really important as we approach the sale of debt and making sure that we aren't buying more than we need. Anything else, guys? I did. I had a couple okay. just other just sort of. An, uh, uh, other type general questions. We're, we're 45 days from the end of 19 and into 20. And several of these items, I, 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 I'm just curious why we are doing some of these in 19 and not included some of them in the 2020 plan. Okay. What, can you point um, to one specific? I'm sorry. Maybe the last <coughs> one on the list, the COIRS. Because that is an agency fund, and the mm -hmm. CORE's board voted in 19 to purchase the shelter building in this, this calendar year. So we are just an agency fund for them. So that was with, with out of our control. And the water and the sewer funds, we will actually do that work this year or well, begin that? The Again, I, I was just, the size of this appropriation change, I was just wondering why some of it was in... Sure. So the, the water and sewer requested in Section 9 mm -hmm. are actually refunds for overpayments, and the developer that overpaid that 
is interested in getting their money as soon as possible. So that's why we're trying to accommodate that request. And avoid interest. Yeah. Okay. Thank and you. The, yeah, okay. Anything else? No. Any other questions? All right. We'll see you back on December 2nd. Thanks, Matt. Uh, resolutions. Resolution 61 19. Appointing members to the Historic Dublin Vision Task Force. I make a motion that we postpone the introduction of this legislation until the December 2nd Council meeting. Is there a second? I'll second. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Saludo? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Mr. Reiner? Yes. Ms. Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Uh, resolution 62 19. Authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with and execute a guaranteed maximum price amendment with Russelli Construction Company Inc. Construction Manager at Risk for the Dublin 5555 Perimeter Drive Renovation Construction Project. I will introduce it. Megan. Good evening, members of Council. As Council is aware, the renovation and construction process for the new City Hall is designed to deliver the administrative offices in the existing 5555 Perimeter Drive building and the new City Hall Council Chambers addition in phases. We have previously provided Council with status updates and that information has been included in your packet for this evening. Following a competitive selection process, Rosilli Construction Company was selected to serve as the construction manager at risk for this project. Rosilli is working closely with the design team and city staff throughout the design development process. We've been focusing our efforts on designing the renovations that are needed for existing City Hall staff to relocate, as well as human resources staff who will be relocating from the service center. This initial construction phase includes items such as selective interior demolition, flooring, LED light fixtures, and lighting controls, HVAC equipment, and fire protection system upgrades. Rosilli completed its competitive bidding process for these items in late October, and Council's approval of this resolution will allow for construction to begin in early December, which is part of the reason why we're phasing these things. This resolution establishes the first guaranteed maximum price contract in the amount of $329,854. An amendment to the GMP for the balance of the renovation work as well as long lead time item purchases for the council chamber's addition will be presented to council at your meeting in December. City staff will begin occupying the new city hall administrative building in April of 2020. And a third amendment to the GMP will encompass the majority of the council chamber's addition work. And that's planned to be presented to city council for approval in May of 2020. We have thoroughly reviewed the pricing and we recommend approval of this resolution. And thank you, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Questions from Cal? Hearing none, Anne? Mr. Rosa? Yes. Vice Mayor Amrose Grooms? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Saluda? Yes. Thank you, Megan. A resolution 63 19, Anne? Authorizing the city manager to enter into a contract with Frost Brown Todd LLC for the provision of legal services. I will introduce it. Dana. Uh, good evening, members of Council. I'm pleased to recommend Council pass Resolution 6319 for legal services for the City of Dublin. As Council is aware, per the revised Charter, Dublin, Ohio, Article 6.03b, the Director of Law shall be appointed by the City Manager subject to the approval of City Council. I've determined the many years of past service of our Law Director and her team of attorneys to be no less than outstanding, and I recommend the continued service of our current Law Director and the provision of legal services by Frost Brown Todd LLC via the agreement provided in your packet and referenced by Resolution 6319. Jennifer and I would be happy to try to answer any questions you might have. Questions from Council? Hearing none, Pam? Mr. Reiner? Yes. Ms. Saluto? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor Amaris Grooms? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Resolution 64-19. Authorizing the city manager went into a collective bargaining agreement with United Steelworkers of America regarding wages, hours, and terms and conditions of employment for employees within the maintenance worker, fleet technician one, electrical worker, and custodial worker bargaining unit. I will introduce it. Homer. Okay. The collective bargaining agreement uh, that has been negotiated between the city and the United Steelworkers is a three-year agreement that calls for a reopener in two specific areas uh, in a year. Uh, those would be wages and health benefits. Um, in terms of wages, uh, wages for all workers covered by this agreement for the first year of this three-year agreement is 2% effective the 1st of uh, January 2020 and subsequent increases for 2021 and 22 are to be determined. 
Um, both parties agreed to leave the health insurance benefit status quo during the first year of the contract in order to facilitate further research and analysis of the health insurance program as it pertains to rising costs. Um, I would like to thank the members of the bargaining teams uh, for both, uh, both sides, the USW and management. Um, as difficult as labor negotiations can be, both sides were very professional and very focused on developing an agreement that works for both sides. Subject to your questions, uh, staff recommends approval of the resolution. Any questions from council? Hearing none, Ann? Mr. Keenan? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. Ms. Saluto? Yes. Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. And Mayor Peterson? Yes. Resolution 65-19. Requesting the Delaware, Franklin, and Union County Auditors to draw money that may be in the county treasuries and to issue a draft to the Director of Finance for the City of Dublin for any money that may be in the accounts for the City of Dublin. I will introduce it, Matt. This is a routine housekeeping resolution to receive the property tax revenue that's currently being held by the Franklin County Auditor about three months early so that we can begin to invest that uh, revenue and earn interest on it during that time period. Any questions from council? Hearing none, Ann? Ms. Saluto? Yes. Uh, Mr. Rosa? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Yes. And Mayor Peterson? Yes. Matthew, you've earned your money tonight. You sure did. We should yeah. get him a stool with his name on it over there. Resolution 66. That'll do. Uh, appointment of a member to an unexpired term on the Community Services Advisory Commission. I will introduce it. Chris. You're up. You're up. Okay. Uh, we have. It's in the screen. Give me just a second. I can Here. open up that. Okay, uh, we have filled a vacancy. We, we did a number of things. Uh, we held our interviews uh, a couple weeks ago. Um, we did select, uh, we, had a, we had a resignation from Stephanie Hall that needed to be filled. We have filled that position with Alice Kananchoff. And uh, we also filled uh, future expiring terms. Those folks will be named at a later date. So. Um, we did have a wonderful pool of applicants come, and I tell you, I think we were so moved by what great folks we had applying for CSAC. We determined that, you know, it might be better in the future to have that board be slightly larger than it's been in the past so that we can accommodate some of the great ideas we heard during the interview process. So um, congratulations to Alice. We look forward to uh, working with her, and um, Jenny has reached out to her, and uh, started all the necessary paperwork, so she will be up and running very shortly. Great. Thank you, Chris. Um, Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mr. Bosa? Yes. Ms. Aluda? Yes. Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. And Mr. Keenan? Under the other portion of our agenda, Riverside Crossing Park Master Sign Plan. Hi, Jenny. Hi, good evening, Mayor, members of Council. Um, as you mentioned, this is a master sign plan for the Riverside Crossing Park. And um, as you recall, Council approved the site plan for this project back in December of last year. Um, so we've outlined the site here just for context purposes. The green area in the center there is really the part that we're focused on um, related to the master sign plan request. Um, so as council will also recall, during um, the construction of the park, there'll be a temporary pathway um, as the bridge will be open and we'll be wanting to provide access from both sides of the river in a safe manner. Um, and in order to do that, obviously there'll be construction fence located on either side of that. Um, and, we, and at council's request, um, to include temporary fence graphics as part of that um, to help showcase what the park is going to look like um, as well as help promote the city and all the wonderful things that we are doing um, as well as you'll see here in the graphics an opportunity to sort of peek into the fence and see what what's going on behind the fence um, so with that the fence will be located um, as you can see sort of in this curvilinear pattern here and the red line on either side of that will be where these temporary graphics will be located Cool. Um, so this is sort of hard to see in scale, but in your packet, um, you'll see that. So it has images of the various views of the park um, as we're approved with the site plan with then information about the park, the park opening, and then the green graphics in between um, have a lot of city statistics that 
talk about um, our intelligent communities, best suburb in Ohio, those types of things, so helping to promote that. And then you'll see here um, in the far right side, it looks like a little gray box. That's where um, these sort of mesh uh, it looks almost like a soccer goal is what I was thinking of um, when you look through it. So you can see into the park. And here's some um, more zoomed in graphics. So you can sort of see through on this side here on the image on the right um, what that can look like. So you can look in there and see what that looks like. So the graphics will be um, a mesh fabric um, and be installed again in panels to then cover um, that entire construction fence leading into the park as well as then along Riverside Drive. So with that, um, staff is recommending approval with no conditions for this master sign plan. And I'm happy to answer Jenny, any Jenny, do you have any uh, information on when this will be installed? Um, my understanding is it will be within the park within the next month or so. And then on Riverside Drive, probably not till after the snow season um, is over just to help preserve them. I know projects. the winter months are really hard on these right. kinds mm -hmm. of fencing. So mm -hmm. right, trying it to would, limit that. You know, mm -hmm. it would be nice to coordinate this the installation for when mm -hmm. pedestrians are mostly expect right. to be back in the area. And right. I, I don't know if we have to get any of it up before, you know, kind of springtime. It would be nice okay. if it looked all nice and fresh together when we were going to have pedestrian activity okay. in the area. But okay. that's just my opinion. Any idea how long it'll be up? <clears throat> um, until, I think it's, a, yeah, eight to ten months. I was thinking it wasn't more than a year. And you so. think it'll wear okay? That's our understanding, yes, as well. Mm -hmm. We can always replace it. Yeah. Yeah. Too ready. But. No, I think I, I think it's a great idea, and I think you guys did a good job with this idea, and uh, I think it's going to add a lot of uh, positive comments about the upcoming park. Do you think about putting pictures of all council members along the way? <laughs> Outgoing, especially. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we thought about we're throwing it. in the river. <laughs> Target practice. Yeah. 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 yeah that's right. Oh, yeah, I make a motion we applaud, uh, approve the master <laughs> sign plan. <laughs> Applauded. Is there a second? second. Yes. Uh, Mr. Yeah. Bosa? Yes. <clears throat> Ms. Aludo? Yes. Mr. Reiner? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Vice Mayor Amaros Grooms? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. And Mr. Keenan? Yes. I'm not even sure where to go with this bullet point <laughs> field trip options. I'm not sure. You and me both. <laughs> I don't know what to do with that other than skip it. Uh, no, we. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> That um, is an ongoing discussion that has um, come out of um, your council goals, uh, part of the retreat. And we did do a tour around this time last year with a few members of council and a few members of the Planning and Zoning Commission and um, stayed local. Um, so we did Westerville, we did New Albany, we met with some of their staff there and then visited Grandview Yard did some explorations in Frankenton where there is some more modern urban infill. Um, but wanted to see what, what you're all thinking in terms of planning this for next year. I mean, we, in the past you've traveled, which will take you know, a little bit more coordination. You are hoping to get together with Planning Commission and ARB more often, so that might be also something that we could discuss with them. But need some guidance ultimately in terms of who all should be there and where do you guys want to go? I well, personally what believe do you see? Jane Fox is the perfect person <laughs> to come up with this list. She, she's on P and Z, she you know, does all this stuff. I think Jane, should come up with Jane, I think you should take a picture of our bridge and go back to Greenville and go. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we were deep in the weeds with our consultants and we had asked them where we could see these kind of finished structures, groups, buildings, whatever, and they said they were going to get back with us because they kept saying, you know, here, you know, you guys are on the right track. They did say that um, we were the model for, even though they had 80 cities in their repertoire of consulting people, that they are now promoting Dublin from New York to San Diego to San Francisco as the model correct way to right. do this. But in parts, parts of that discussion with them, if you recall, we said, well, where is the, um, and I forgot where we were in that tangent, but where is the uh, other things and can you come back? And they were supposed to come back with a list of things that would really help us advance the next step. So 
I don't know if they ever did. I don't. I never heard back from them. So I'd like to see what they thought. You're talking about Don Elliott, the yeah, and the, uh, that came. Yeah, and the, and they said, yeah, you know, here's what you guys, you know, probably need to go see. But they never gave us the names of what we needed to go see. So I think that would be an interesting uh, field trip if we're going to have a field trip. I. I also think it would be interesting as we think about um, entrepreneurial centers and the future of the deck and some of those, there's just been a, an enormous amount of innovation going on, on incubation of business and that type of thing. So um, I don't know how local we could do that. I'm not sure we have to, I don't know, but I, I would be particularly interested in um, opportunities. I, I very much like the field trip that we did last time. Yeah. It was very interesting to hear I mean, you'll see it as you drive by that, but actually when we were able to engage with staff and talk to them about the good, the bad, and the challenging that they had, it was very useful. So I think as we think about the future of economic um, incubators and how that's working, I, I, I would vote for doing something like that. I think that's on Director Gilder's, Gilger's uh, homework list to, to pull together. So I don't know if she's still here. She left. She we'll was, give it to her if it's not. She went home to work on it, <laughs> evidently. But, yeah, I know that she, she was supposed to be working at that and maker spaces. Yeah. And, yeah. and we had similar discussions as well about some of the um, places that were the inspiration for the DCAP. Um, that, again, it would require travel, but there are definitely case studies in the professional literature as well as inspirations that are some of these images that are in that plan. In, uh, in, in our leisure time, uh, maybe we could make a list of some of the criteria, some of the things that we'd be interested in seeing. Like, it was great to go through the city to see what was going on in different parts, but um, we frequently use phrases like a variety of housing, uh, placemaking, uh, what is trendy with the millennials. And it might be interesting to have a little list of these little subtopic criteria and then look for, this, look for maybe nearby cities. Like a new word now is flexible zoning coming out of Cleveland. Um, maybe we could try to figure out if there are some cities that have some really amazing um, developments around some of the things that we're trying to, you know, to improve on or increase here. We use the word placemaking, but it'd be nice to see examples of really great placemaking. Public art, some things that are really unusual that we might want to think about that we haven't had a chance to be exposed to and we might want to, you know, bring forward to our, to our cultural arts people. I don't know. I don't have the names of any places, but I certainly have a list of what I'd love to see. So um, I, I think I would also be really interested in, in finding some cities that um, have successfully integrated some um, different housing options. Um, that fit not only in with um, availability for, you know, I think I'm thinking in particular about senior affordability, um, uh, but as well as staying with sort of the look and the feel of the city that they're in, um, in terms of building standards and things of that nature. Um, so I'd be really interested in, in taking a look at what might be out there in that realm. That helps. Thank you. Well, is that enough guidance for you there, Claudia? It'll give us a great starting point, Good yes. And absolutely. Okay. If you think of anything else, just let us know and we'll, we'll make an inventory. Okay, great. Thank you. Staff comments, Dana? A few items I want to lift up that were in your packet, one of which I need some guidance from you on. Uh, the first, though, I do want to mention that we did make application for the uh, state capital budget. You may have seen this in your, uh, in your packet. Um, these get harder and harder to do. It seems like every time and the advice we get is the criteria gets tougher. So after we scoured that guidance that we were hearing from different organizations, um, we narrowed it down to the uh, log cabin that had been discovered under the house on Riverside Drive and we had dis, dis, had been donated to the city. We disassembled it. We stored it. We would like to reconstruct that um, over on uh, Ferris Wright Park uh, and we, we've applied uh, for state capital dollars to try to get funding to do that. So we'll see if we're successful or not, uh, but just want to make you aware of that. Um, one item I do need some guidance on uh, is uh, in regards to VIP club changes at the Dublin Iris Festival. Staff provided a memo uh, regarding proposed changes to that. Uh, after a couple adjustments and lessons learned over the last couple of years, uh, staff's recommending certain changes in reference 
as referenced in the memo. Fundamentally, these changes are to lower the membership cost to the Emerald Club by $50. Uh, those pay, these paying guests uh, and other non-paying guests of the Emerald Club would purchase alcoholic beverages separately. Uh, this will reduce confusion and ensure compliance with legal and auditor requirements. We certainly want those members and guests to enjoy their experience, so uh, we would make purchasing as convenient as possible there. The sponsors will receive a certain amount of beverage tokens uh, with their sponsorship package, and that approach is in compliance, again, with legal and auditor requirements. Staff's also proposing an increase in prices for all the other VIP clubs due to the overwhelming demand for them, and those changes are reflected in the memo. So I think the memo does a good job of uh, breaking all that out and explaining it, and I'm seeking your concurrence with staff's recommended changes, but Matt, Alice, and I will do our best to answer any questions you might have on that. You know, that. I think that alcohol policy is consistent with what we did at the tournament with the, it is. Correct. what do you call it, the villa. It's the responsible right thing. So you're saying you could buy tokens at the Emerald Club? Right, that's our intent. But what about, so you'd have to go outside right. to, to get a beer or whatever, Correct. and then back and forth? Would oh, there, there be, would not, would there well, be? I think, unless Allison's going to come up here and tell me different. That's the way I read it. She's that's what she told me last. She has a really good answer. I think answer. there's going to be alcohol yeah. in the. She told me last we could do that. <laughs> we do still plan on having a bar in the Emerald Club. We're looking at some different options, but we want to have um, ability to actually purchase the tokens in there. The other thing that will change is instead of before, you weren't allowed to take alcohol outside of Emerald Club. Now you'll be able to take it in and out. And any tokens that you might buy in the Emerald Club, you can use anywhere as well. Good. So there were some of the other clubs that they were offering packages of 20 or 30 or whatever. I want to say 1500 or $2,000. Is that 20 tickets for each day or for the, like the Dub Club, I guess, would be a separate aside from the Emerald? Yeah, and um, so it's one of those things. We have a couple different options. You can do the one that you get into get all, the, all, three. all three clubs. Um, the Celtic Rock Club. But the, those, are, those are each piece. Yes. And so you, you'd have to have four of them to be able to get four people each day in each club. Correct, Okay. Yeah. The other ones are like packages, it looked like. Yeah, because um, right now, for, for example, in the Celtic Rock Club, if you as an individual want to go to the Celtic Rock Club. Excuse me, Allison, is your microphone oh. on? No, it's you. not. Sorry. <laughs> um, to get into the Celtic Rock Club now, you either have to be with a group or you could buy that v the VIP package that does all three because we don't have individual seats in that Celtic Rock Club. It's the big clubs together, whereas the other clubs you can buy individual ones. So if you get the package of 20, is that just for one day? It costs that much for each day. So I, I yeah. have to, I'd have to pick three days worth times whatever. Correct, yes. And the, uh, is that a minimum 20, or can you get 10? Or No, I mean, you would have to, well, the, the, the price is, and you get 20. So if you only bring 10, you're wasting your 10. But you have to buy at least that. Whatever the, the deal is, is the deal. Correct. I can't buy four, or I can't buy 10 individually. No. Okay, I just wanted to clarify. You want a motion on that, Dane? Did anybody else have any other comments? I would you, appreciate that. I make a motion that we approve the policy outlined in the memo with respect to the Dublin Irish Festival. I'll second. And. Um, Mr. Rosa? Yes. Ms. Saludo? Yes. Ms. Fox? Yes. Mayor Peterson? Yes. Mr. Keenan? Mr. Yes. Reiner? Yes. And Vice Mayor Ambrose Grimes? Yes. Uh, also, there was a memo in your packet about the Ped Bridge. There seems to be confusion out there about the cost of the bridge and are we in budget. Sometimes when you're running behind on a project, it makes it look like you're over budget. I, I just we wanted to assure you, and I appreciate Megan putting a memo together, and she's still shaking her head, yes, we're within budget. Uh, we are not within the original time frame that we had proposed, but we're getting close. And uh, But we just wanted to point that out. So all that information and the breakdown of the cost is there. And if you can carry that in your back pocket as residents ask you about that, you can share that with them. Um, also, uh, appreciate Matt's information on the Riverside Crossing Park design update. That's at 90% design and hence some of the previous um, decisions you were making about moving some of this funding up so that we can save some funding and help with construction sequencing and the like. So I just want to make sure that that was cross-referenced with some of your earlier decisions. And then the last is there was a mobility update put into the packet, and I appreciate staff really standing back and putting that whole comprehensive package together. I know there's been a lot of pieces and parts between um, Forever Dublin uh, initiatives and also with our uh, mobility with some of our businesses and otherwise and some of the smart cities initiatives and the like, uh, that they did a great job of pulling all that together. So with that, unless you have any questions, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Dana. I had a question about, so so Dana, thoughts about when to br bring that back? I know we've gotten some additional grants to continue to work on that pilot, but to bring that back with some um, moving from a pilot to a more either permanent or 
not do it or whatever that decision is uh, to bring that back to council what's the current thinking about that uh I, I don't really know. I don't have okay. an answer. Let me check and advise on that. I, I, I think we're really still trying to sort out, number one, the fact that we got it, which was great, and two, um, now that we caught the bus, what do we do with it? So um, <laughs> we have got a, we've got a, lot of, uh, we got a lot of great ideas. I think we gotta, we got to narrow those down and get to what execution is going to look like with that money. So, so another sort of six-month pilot phase right, continuation. Right. Okay. Uh, we will definitely report out on that. Great. That, and, Megan, you are a superstar for delivering that bridge on budget. I mean, as complicated as that thing is, has got to be one of the most complex projects I've seen here in 30 years, run by the city and not by outside developers, to be uh, to coordinate those five different entities and to bring that thing in on budget is absolutely amazing. So we all owe you a debt of gratitude. Thank you. Anything else, Dana? No, sir. That That's it? all. Okay. Committee reports. P and Z. Jane. I don't have. Any. How about admin, Chris? Uh, no, I gave a report on our uh, appointment. Uh, community development, John. Community uh, development met on November the 6th um, for just about an hour and 15 minutes. We had three items. Uh, one item was short-term rentals. Uh, I would say our uh, legal counsel will be coming back with that. And it looks like from some of the discussion that there's going to be a registration fee and that it's going to be limited to two weeks. And uh, a number of people spoke um, very uh, articulately on, on the problems they were suffering from the ones that were surrounding them currently. And we also had some good uh, feedback from actually from the audience, so, which we're going to incorporate into the uh, ordinance. Um, next item was short uh, temporary and commercial signage, which will probably end up down at P&Z because it's, there's all kinds of levels of signage and size shapes and everything else. So that will be heading over to, to uh, P and Z. Last item was uh, the st uh, streetscape tree selection in historic Dublin. And uh, what we would like to do as a committee, and we hope you support us on this, is that um, the trees stay the same on each street so that they actually perform a function as beautifying the street and unifying all the different kinds of architecture. We didn't realize until Matt showed us that the law was changed when I was out of the government, by the way, because I wrote the original law in 1993. And so this variation of trees, which seems to be rather confusing of ups, downs, different shapes and heights appeared. So we weren't aware of that, but we would like the city to go back to grouping the trees on each street to try to get that uniformity of architectural integrity so that there's a psychological commonness again. So we're hoping that we go back to that. And should a disease come in, something like the emerald ash borer will only lose a street tree. Uh, and that would be better, better than having a picket fence with all the pickets knocked out here and there, which is sort of the current look that a lot of cities have adopted. So we're trying to get back to that more um, architecturally integrated uh, uniform patterning. So that's what we've discussed, and that's what we sort of decided on. Wouldn't that be correct? I would Any only, other comments? I would only add that, um, you know, we reviewed that legislation afterwards, and I think the legislation should be reviewed, but I think you can read it either way, that, it, that the trees could be um, consistent by street rather than, you know, it, it's, it's really a problem that we manufactured. You know, we, instead of having Oak Street, Maple Street, Elm Street, we made every street in the city Ash Street, right? And so that was a problem that we created by our own contentness to overuse a single tree so uh, we, we can look at the at the language um, I, I don't know that it precludes us from doing what it is we want to do I think it could be read in that fashion so and you know that's common to uh, almost all the cities had uh, ash trees about 20 to 25 percent of them a lot of them because they could take the urban stress really well and grow between a sidewalk and a street and really do well and flourish and have a nice head so now, it's nothing that our department's, you know, at fault. It's just was, and then they invented a huge number of hybrids with red leaves and everything else and became a very popular tree. Who knew that some boards would arrive from China in a pallet in Michigan and wipe out all the uh, ash trees in America, so. 
Okay. okay. So the follow-up for that was that I think staff was going to bring back a comprehensive sort of landscape back to the for community. the historic district. For the historic district, a street so treescape the, for the historic district was my. And, and we were also thinking about um, when they do that to increase the cadence of them, so tighten up the uh, the lineal footage between the trees to give us more of a a uh, sort of a instead of just having six trees, which was the whole discussion. Maybe we could add some extra additional trees to both sides. What I'm going to ask Matt to do is repeat back to you what we think the motion is to make sure we're really clear for the record on what, okay. what we're going to do. So would you um, articulate that back? Yeah, I will, I will selfishly request, though, for South High Street, we recognize its importance and its, you know, and it's the feel that we're looking for. We are under great constraints conditionally to be able to plant what we want and to get it to look the way we want it. Um, I would almost recommend a site visit down there to tour it, to take a look at it, so we can have a better idea of what options we might have. I would welcome that with the committee or council as a full, however, sure. however you please to Schedule do Schedule our next no, committee meeting there. Yeah. We'll come down with a handful of flags and flag out all your trees for you. Read my mind. Uh, we'll do it for you. <laughs> Free of charge. So we'll do that, and we'll also, from what I'm understanding, we'll bring some um, amended language back to you for consideration for the uh, street um, street tree code in itself, just to clarify what um, Vice Mayor Emma Grooms was referring to, Great. if you wish. Thank you. Okay. And, and Matt, and the, then you will bring back a designed streetscape for the trees? After the site after visit, after. yes. Okay. Great. Thanks. Anything else, John? That's it. Finance, Mike. Thank you. Yes, we had a uh, hotel motel tax grant applications uh, meeting on the 13th. Um, we had a very good, uh, robust group and, and uh, came up with um, consensus, at least at the committee level, which we'll report on next meeting. Matthew, you have some other homework to do as a result of that. Thank you. Public Services Committee. Uh, nothing, Christina? Nothing this time. Coda, Kathy. Uh, just one quick thing that today the new customer service center opened uh, at 33 North High. Um, the, the redesign, I had a chance to see that. Well, there'll be a ribbon cutting uh, at the board meeting this Wednesday. But it really has changed the um, really focus of that from coming in to buy a ticket to come in to figure out how to solve uh, mobility needs. And uh, it, it's quite a lovely design. So I encourage folks, if you're downtown, um, check it out. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, Dublin Friendship Association, Christina? Nothing. We meet tomorrow. Morpsy, Chris? Yeah, we uh, had an executive meeting uh, and a board meeting last week. I, I did, um, we've talked a lot about these, uh, the PACE financing, and I, Thea Walsh sits on the board that does the PACE financing, and she offered to take uh, back to the board some of the difficulties that we were having and why the costs were running so high. So hopefully we'll see some movement in that area. She was going to... Um, I think be reaching out to you, Matt. I think I gave her your contact information to just uh, get an idea of the things that we were having to do, uh, and you as well, Jennifer, um, for those pace financing. See if they can't streamline that process on their end a little bit. So, thank you. Thank you, Chris. Uh, Logan Union, Champaign County Regional Planning Commission, Kathy. Uh, yeah, the annual dinner and meeting is this Thursday, and staff and I will be attending. A lot of activities, so it um, it should be a, a, a great evening. Uh, Northwest 33 quarter group, Kathy and Jane. Nothing. Nothing. Uh, Dublin Arts Council, John. Yeah, one of the great uh, Japanese artists is back, uh, Masayuki. And he, uh, his studio is actually by Mishuko, our sister city. And um, he, uh, let's see, we opened him up here last week. I think it was on Tuesday night. That was the opening of his exhibit. And many of you have collected his works, which are very, very interesting. And he's got a really a new line of uh, ceramics out that's really beautiful. So I know you're all probably familiar with having him back the last, you know, I guess we've had him here for three or four times. Uh, fantastic artist. So if you get a chance, stop in the Dublin Arts Building and take a look at his work. Great. Thanks, John. Uh, Dublin Board of Education. Christina? Nothing. That's right. I do not see my friends from Washington Township, so I don't think we have any. AWOL. I guess they're AWOL. Uh, Dublin Bridges, Jane. How about we stay right there with you with the round table? I just want to bring up or ask the question of, I know we've talked about property maintenance codes, and I know we're working on that sort of thing, but um, there's been a conversation around the, the existing vacant properties, and I had brought up to uh, Dana and Jennifer that there is a 
vacant building ordinance that 116 different communities in Ohio have now started to use to stop um, um, allowing vacant buildings to just fall into disrepair. Um, I grew up on the west side of Columbus and my own home is a vacant building right now. And what happens is if we leave these vacant buildings up, they decrease the property values next to them. You lose re tax revenue, starts to change a neighborhood. It becomes almost epidemic sometimes. I don't anticipate that's going to happen in Dublin, but um, it does happen in cities. Vacant buildings just left like that without any kind of demand for the cost being borne by the person who owns the building to repair it um, ends up uh, degrading the neighborhood pretty quickly. So. I'm encouraging us to get, um, to get that maintenance code, a new one, up and going and look at the vacant uh, building ordinance as a possibility of registration by a landowner. And those can be not necessarily burdensome for people who are trying to renovate or rent. In, in fact, you can actually use the ordinance to incentivize people to um, do something with a vacant building. So if we can work together to do that, I, I would be so appreciative. Yeah, we've um, met with planning staff. It's my understanding that that is a pending topic for a public services committee. And we had a meeting and it was <coughs> set to be rescheduled. And I don't think that's been rescheduled yet. Anne's shaking her okay. head no. So it is a topic that's up for consideration. Yeah, I think it could be a very easy, uh, quite an easy fix, especially since the maintenance code that we're under now, I think is 2009, and there's a 2019 international maintenance code that that gives us a lot more protections on the exterior of our buildings as well as interiors sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, that's all. Thank you, Jane. Kathy? Just one thing, I wanted to say thanks so much for the city staff. I know I'd commented a few times about leave pickup, and I know with all the snow how difficult it was, I, I can say they were in um, my neighborhood on Sunday picking leaves up, and so they are working overtime, and um, it, it's hard work. And I just wanted to say how much I appreciated that. Um, that's a lot. So thank you. Thank you, Kathy. John? Matt, bring your uh, favorite trees, and we'll meet downtown, and we'll have a sticking party. So uh, looking forward to it. It'll be fun. Mike? Nothing. Christina? I'm good. Chris? Uh, just Veterans Day was a really nice celebration for us to uh, – they did an excellent job of executing that, so that was really nice to see with the kids. Uh, I wanted to thank Steph, uh, Senator Kunze for um, really sending us the notes. And, you know, it was amazing when you sit around table with other electeds. Not, not every senator sends out those letters and says, you know, give me your ideas of what you want in the budget. And so I appreciate that. Um, and then wanted to congratulate the um, honorees for the uh, Irish Festival for this year. That was certainly a, a yeah. nice opportunity to recognize them. That's all. Thank you. It was a great meeting, and you really realize how many people in this community are involved in the Irish Festival that have nothing to do with the staff or any of us. I mean, it is a Dublin community event. Um, the only other thing I have is to encourage everyone, Wednesday night at 4 o'clock at the Dublin Integrated Education Center out at OU, we will be um, taking a minute to pause and thank our friend Mike Keenan for 36, I always get it wrong, it tells me it's more than it is. This is now like 450 years of service, I think. Methuselah. Um, 17, 1,782 Methuselah meetings. Mike Keenan. <laughs> but who's counting? Uh, but in all seriousness, please come out and take a minute to uh, express appreciation to Mike for everything he's done for this community. Dana. Mayor, I'm sorry, and I apologize to Michelle for this, but this is Michelle's last uh, Council meeting, 27 years of being in this room and uh, attending council meetings. How, I don't know how many years that equals in dog years or whatever, but um, but anyway. <laughs> but anyway, um, I can sign up for that too. I know exactly what that means. So anyway, but I just want to publicly acknowledge Michelle for all her work as well. And um, we'll be, we will certainly, yeah, standing O. We'll, we'll be celebrating Michelle's... Uh, Is that the 10th? Departure. December 10th? 10th, yes. Mm -hmm. Michelle, I told you I grew up in Hillier. They're tough down there. <laughs> <laughs> okay, with that, we are adjourned.